What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Fast Life Podcast. I'm waiting on Danger Dan right now as we speak, and my man Jaden. You saw him on the vlog recently. Uh, call me Dragon. If you guys don't mind, please check out in the description below our sponsors. They help us keep this podcast going and growing. Uh, if you want to become a patron as well, there's a link right down there below. And you can help support this podcast to bring on more guests like Danger Dan and people from all over the country. So if you guys haven't heard of Danger Dan, he's literally the most interesting man on a motorcycle, in my opinion. Glad to have him on the podcast. He's also the one that got me into podcasting back in 2017 when he had me on as a guest. He's, he's one of the OGs in the podcast game for motorcycles, and he's been doing it since 2016. Danger Dan's Talk Shop. If you've listened to this podcast, I'm pretty sure you have checked out his at some point in time, if not every time he releases one. Uh, great guest, great interviewer, great perspective he brings to the table, and um, just honored to have him on my show. What's up, baby? What's up, dude? You ready to get weird? Get weird. Got this full of uh, Everclear. Sprite. <laughs> dude, it seems like you guys have been fucking huffing paint in here, dude. That's what we do in here, buddy. <laughs> Cruising down the road. Got a little wet on the way here. Yeah, it really smells like you guys have been huffing paint here. It doesn't smell like anything's been getting done. Dan, welcome, man. Dude, it's like just like I remembered it pretty much. <laughs> fucking go live and it's like scared to talk. Uh, oh. No, so what I was going to tell you, so it says Magui on this bottle, right? Yeah. So the beginning of that last trip, which they actually, what's today? Thursday, they do the Mezcal Motor Rally starting again tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. So it's been like a year to the day I left my house to do that trip. Like yeah. I left today to go to Austin, went to the hand built show at the Castle Party, slept under Bat Bridge, and then went to Mexico. But at the end of the Mezcal Motor Rally, I bought a, you know, I went through Oaxaca and I was buying all the Mezcal at every fucking farm I stopped yeah. at, you know. They had like this crazy, uh, it's like this chocolate drink, uh -huh. and you would, they would serve it in like an espresso shot. I don't know if it had caffeine in it or not, but it was so fucking good. I mean, I was. I remember when, he came, when I came to your house and we did the podcast together, you had a couple bottles of mezcal we tried. Really? It was so there. we've done a podcast since I started this trip? You had mezcal. You said it was from yeah. the side of the road stuff. In, in oh, no, that was from the Desperado run. Is that what that was when from? When we rode okay. the choppers, like, straight through Mexico. Because I can't remember if, like, That you... shit was gnarly. That was, like, <laughs> fucking bathtub shit in a plastic <laughs> bottle with a scorpion in it. But I this can't... shit is different. It's different? Well, it's that... Americanized? No, I don't know. I'm Like, that... No. What we drank was, like... Like bathtub crank or something. Yeah. You're like, it was not, <laughs> you know. I don't know what the fuck it was. It's like, my buddy still got that bottle. For real. But, uh, no, what I was going to say is, so I bought, you know, they had other shit. So I bought, like, this fucking pepper or something in a dill and bought some shit. Went, and I went and met my buddy in Costa Rica, and we're, like, cooking eggs, and we're putting shit on there. And what we were using was, like, ground up maggots that's what the fucking the pepper shit that i bought was i had no idea i was putting it on all sorts of shit i mean i kept doing it once i found out it was maggots too but that sounds gross no matter how you look at it it was like maggots and peppers like you just can't even tell they like use the the maggots are part of the process somehow mm -hmm. i don't don't get me lying but <laughs> the magui made me think is of that it. why it makes it hard for people to uh, eat and drink down there they just get their stomach's not ready for it or something like that um, yeah, I guess. Well, anyway, I dude, we're, we're off on a tangent here. People are like, what the fuck are they talking about? Uh, anyway, first off, I want to say you're coming up on seven years of the Danger Dance Talk Shop this year, right? You know more than I do. I Yeah, because I keep track of shit like this. <laughs> I'm a numbers dude. Because you started in 2016, like late okay. 16. See, I was wondering the other day when I started the podcast, because yeah. I think I'm on, this is the fifth year of t-shirts. Okay. So I've done this, I've featured... 48 shops at the beginning of this year and what we're in the fourth month, so 52 shops. Mm. Next month will be May, Indian Larry. That, yeah. That'll be 55, mm -hmm. 53, 53. Like I said, it's, it's, been a, it's been a long run, man. Like I said, it, it doesn't even feel like it's been seven years or six years because I kind of – I met you officially in 2016 at, like, Chopper Supply back in the day. Like, I think it was a pre-party for uh, – Southern Throwdown yep. back in like September or something like that. And um, 
like I said, I was thinking about this the other day, you know, knowing that you were going to come on, and I was just – that 2017 year, the first time you asked me to be on the podcast and, you know, hanging out at Tim O'Keefe's house one night when you did the podcast with Joey Cano with the, with the giddy up bike giveaway. And like, it just seems like, I didn't realize you were at that one. I was there. I was watching y'all do the podcast in the garage. Mm. And then it was like a week or so afterwards when you asked me to come on yours. So man, it's been like seven years, dude. Like that's, that's, that's fucking, that's awesome. You know what I mean? (laughs) Congratulations, Jace. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> uh, no, it is. It's crazy. Uh, I've done a lot in that seven years, too. It's crazy to think that, you know, all this stuff that you've been doing for the last seven years, you know, the podcast was kind of like, to use your word again, kind of like the anchor to give you a connection to all this. And it's funny how, not funny, it's it's awesome how you would have guests on because you were interested in something they were doing, and that would inspire you, and you've lived this fucking insane life since then. I mean, if you really think about it, like if you go back down the Danger Dan timeline, <laughs> yeah, know. you go from just riding a chopper on the side, and then you know, I remember the early day road shows. You oh know, oh my god, those were good. Huh? <laughs> they were. They were. I with still the music. get people who they're like, "Bring back the road shows," and yeah. I'm like, "I don't know, things have just changed. My bike runs so much better now." <laughs> so it's going to talk about. It's like, oh, that was an easy trip, you know? No, there was always something. You know that. Yeah. I mean, even on a brand new bike where you press the button every time. Yeah. Dude, shit happens out there. But it's just like, it's been this progressive timeline of like all these different things, these different rabbit holes you've kind of gone down just to experience it. Like from going heavy as hell with flat track racing, you know, the hooligan stuff to then finally jumping on adventure bikes or wanting to go down that path, building the sports or doing the mint 400, doing all these other runs, doing these, what they call them BDR roads all over America. And then, you know, leading up to now, it's like, I mean, to me, it's just like, that's, that's just, it's awesome. Like you, you continue to get an idea and then do it. You know what I'm saying? And I mean, I, I try to live that way. Dude, the wind's personally. just blowing me around, dude. I'm just like a butterfly chaser. Okay. Just exactly. I've been giving my kid, one of my kids, I got both kids in jujitsu. Mm-hmm. And one of them, man, he fucking, he hammers down all the time. And the young one, he's just like, sometimes he cares, sometimes, sometimes he doesn't. doesn't. And I'm like, fuck, I, I'm the same way, you know? Yeah. Or just like gets distracted by, you know, he cares all the time, but like, you know, I see shiny things. It's always like a running joke when you're riding behind me, like, oh shit, Dan saw something shiny because <laughs> I just turn and go someplace else that wasn't really in the plan. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, this whole idea for the doing this Pan America down all the way, like how did it, I mean, I, I want to say that we kind of touched on it last time you were here a little bit, but just for context of now, like what was, what was the motivation to go ahead and go through with the whole thing and you know how did how did it all kind of transpire and come together? Well, you know, years ago I planned on doing it. Mm-hmm. You know, the original Mezcal Moto Rally, which is a three day race through Mexico, fueled by Mezcal and tacos, was supposed to happen in 2020. And I built that adventure bike out of the Sportster. the Sportster that I raced the mid 400 on. And then, right before 2020, I went to Nepal. Remember that? And it was fucking awesome. You know, when we went over there, we just rented bikes mm-hmm. and we had fucking guys that just showed us all the badass shit. You know, Bear and his partner, Booty, they put a lot of work into like maximizing our time mm-hmm. over there. And I was just like, shit. You know, before then, I wanted to ride, do the Pan America Highway, you know, ride a bike. Just ride my own personal bike to faraway places. Yeah. Well, after doing that, I was like, fuck that, you know? Like, now I just want to go to Columbia and ride and, like, rent a bike and fucking pay a tour guide to show me all the badass shit, you know? That way I can maximize my time away from home. Yeah. And then, uh, so then, and, you know, I was kind of thinking about that. And then when the Mezcal Motor Rally got shut down, I was going to do the same or similar. I was going to ride at least down to see Rob Rouser in Panama after mm-hmm. the Mezcal Motor Rally. 2020, you know, we all know what the fuck happened. Yeah. So the race got canceled. And then, you know, I really started, like, reevaluating how I was going to travel. You know, because, honestly, Motorcycle Sherpa changed my outlook on just – effectively using my time you know and i was starting to realize like how much i was away from home and Mm. you know wanted to maximize that so really i my plan or dream of doing it kind of disappeared at one point you know where i was like 
I didn't care to do that. You know, like, yeah, I want to ride down there, but I didn't want to take the time to go do it. And then, um, you know, what happened after that? Oh, yeah, I got the fucking Pan America, you know? Yeah. And <laughs> that bike was... 21? <coughs> I got it two years ago this yeah, month. So 21. Yeah. Yeah, I just saw, <clears throat> saw the notification a day or two ago of the day Jones, Kyle, everybody went to the road and one. did that yeah. demo ride. Yeah. Yeah. And so you got it because you demo you, stop in the North American. I mean, you literally had it, and within like, because wasn't a motorcycle Tennessee motorcycle revival in May that year twenty one? Because mm-hmm. you had already had the thing flamed out from Chemical Candy at that point in time. Yeah, so I you, got it like fucking twenty days before that. That's right. Yeah. Because he did that ten day pay job and was just he still doesn't like me anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's been two years. Yeah. So, yeah, I got that bike, and then the Mezcal Motor Rally race came up. And at this point, I had some other things like ideas going on that I was going to pursue and uh, some business ventures, if you will. And I had a friend in Costa Rica. And I'm looking at the Mezcal Moto Rally map, and I'm like, fuck, I'm halfway to Costa Rica. Maybe I should just go see my buddy Terry. You know, like, just ride down there. If the bike's running good, when I get to the bottom of Mexico, I might as well keep going. Mm -hmm. So I did that. You know, went through the in the Mezcal Motor Rally race was you know it wasn't a race, but I did show up like thinking I'm I'm gonna beat these motherfuckers. You know, where'd you go? Where'd you cross into Mexico at in Texas? That year, by Laredo. So we were supposed to. So they gave us like a pamphlet mm-hmm. of like you know the direction the the pass we were supposed to go or they wanted us to go and they wanted us to cross. I think at a place called Colombia. Mm-hmm which is like this side border crossing that's really easy to go through. I've been through there since then, and it's like, it's super easy. Mm -hmm. But me, like a month before the race, the cartel like blew up one of our embassies or, you know, like blew some shit up. And I was like, I got to go fuck. I got to go to that crossing, you know, like (laughs) see what that looks like. So I didn't go to the one that everybody else did, but I don't, that was like one border crossing south of there, like where all the traffic was. Yeah. And, uh, Crossed right there. Yeah, dude. Yeah, the Mezcal. So the Mezcal Motor Rally, they had all these challenges and shit, mm-hmm. which was a great idea. Except for the challenges were more geared to, like, people who would never go to Mexico without, you know. People with them or something like that? Yeah, or just being incentivized. You know, like okay. trying to open people, like, people that wouldn't normally go on their own, unlike me, giving them things to, like, brighten up their experience or, like, make them more uh, engaged in the culture. Yeah. And make things a little bit more challenging than just riding to the first stop. Well, my dumbass is going to, like, I just made it way more challenging on my own, you know, like, without doing yeah. their, the challenge. You know, like, once again, I went through the fucking crossing where they just blew it up. It said, don't go to Monterey. I went, you know, Monterey's were fucking Topo Chico's bottles. So I'm like, I got to go. <laughs> There's, like, this picture of this neighborhood in Monterey, and it's all these beautiful houses on this hillside. They're all different colors. And, like, I got to go there. So I go there and get a Tobo Chico, and I learn there that Tobo Chico's got, like, three different uh, carbonation strengths. Mm-hmm. One of them's only available in Mexico, and it's, like, fucking, you know, where your nose hairs just start fucking doing this when you're drinking it. It's a good burn. Yes, yeah, so I went there. I had one of the Tobo Chicos, and then I found out later on that that's the most dangerous neighborhood in Monterey. The nice one? The, well, well, I didn't say it was nice. You said it was pretty or some shit, didn't well, It's just very colorful. You know, like, but you know, it's like, uh, it's not like really nice houses, but it's like the people in that neighborhood take pride in their, yeah, in their house. It's not like it's big and they have a huge yard, but like, you know, they're like people of the uh, community. You know, they're they're from Monterey. You know, so what? Like, so let me go back to this border crossing thing. How? <laughs> I, th- I think that's the only thing I'm kind of nervous about. Like, because I really want to do a Mexico run. I don't know when it's going to be time. You know, this mm-hmm. whole thing that you just did is like my goal in life, right? Um, don't think about it too much. Well, I, I'm an overthinker, though. I have, <laughs> that's just the way I'm designed. You know, seven years. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and I mean, like, I, I don't, like, uh, I don't know. I just think about, like, what what the vibe is like as soon as you cross into Mexico, which I know you've been into Mexico quite a few times, like doing the El Diablo runs and the other stuff that you've done with like Kickstart Mike and everything. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. I feel like just running through that border alone, right? 
and then going how far into Mexico before you start linking up with other people? I mean, there's no when like. I went through Monterey. Yeah. It was awesome, too. Like so, I'm, like, th- does it feel completely normal? Like, once you get no, into No, as it? soon as you cross that fucking line. Yeah. It's crazy. Like, even in Central America, every time you cross a border, the culture changes like that. Mm. And it's it's insane. I didn't, uh, you know, I, not th- I guess at that point I did expect it. I knew what I was getting t- into crossing into Mexico. But then just crossing into Guatemala, it changed again, mm. which kind of caught me off guard. I thought, you know. You know, that Central America was just a Mexicans from further south, but it's not, you know, like the further you get away from Mexico, the harder it is to find like a tortilla with meat in it. Mm. Like, it's funny, like in Mexico, you find the tortilla on the taco with the meat and stuff inside. And the further you get away from Mexico going south, the further the tortilla gets away from your plate, you know, like (laughs) first it's like beside it or like on the plate, but it doesn't have food in it. And then it's next to the plate. And then it's like. Get it's just it. gone. Yeah, no, they don't even have it anymore, you know? Uh, but, yeah, each border is, especially Mexico and Texas. Mm-hmm. Now, there's some spots, like, in America where right on the border it kind of feels, you know, like Mexico. But, dudes, I'm, even then, once you cross, it's like – and I think there's also, like, the element of, like, not being able to have – you don't have a lifeline at that point. Mm-hmm. You know, like, you just crossed the border. Mm-hmm. You don't have the same, like, uh, resources. Yeah. Even though they're right over there, you can't use them the same way once you're in Mexico. But, I mean, it's that's that's what also like, what makes it so awesome is just yeah. that feeling of, like, it's like you just challenge. ventured out, you yeah. know? It's like, well, you know, I didn't even learn hardly any Spanish or, you know, any of the languages. Uh, but it's kind of like, you know, accentuates that feeling of being someplace foreign, you know? Mm. Not even being able to speak their language. Now, it, it did. It does have its downsides, but you know, I like I like that feeling of just kind of being. Mm. So, would away. you say Spanish is like the main language that would have helped you throughout the entire trip? Absolutely. You know what I mean. You know, it slowly evolved as I went south too. Mm. I like the phrases, and I think the you know words kind of take on different meanings. You know, they're mm. still using the same language; they just use it a little differently. It's like different dialects almost. Yeah. Since I don't speak it very well at all, I don't know if that's the correct way to explain it, but that's kind of the way I took it, like different, because essentially they're speaking the same language. They just, you know, and really like a lot of the words, if once, if you seem spelt out, you can almost tell what that word is. Yeah. You know, like it's like they don't know how to spell or pronunciate the words that they're trying to say, you know, because they're so close to American, but they're just not, you know. They're not the same. Yeah, I, I was listening to, to uh, a couple other things that you've done since you've been back, uh, you know, talking about this trip. And uh, most of it talks about South America. You know what I mean? I think that's what's what's out there right now, especially through other podcasts that you've done and, and whatnot. But Did you watch the Grand Teton video? Yeah, that one was pretty – I was watching that all day today, actually. Um, and that was – you, you went into so much depth in kind of like the southern – or Dude, they were like, America. all right – Give us like a five minute intro. <laughs> and then we recorded for three hours. <laughs> dude, I showed up there. I wished I'd had sunglasses, dude. Dude, I didn't go to sleep but like two hours before that. For real. Oh my gosh. I couldn't believe that I did that to myself right before I was going on camera. Mm. I'm like, what you're an idiot, <laughs> dude. So I mean, as you kind of like moved your way down, you were going to did was this idea already at this point when you were going down to Panama to see your friend? To just continue to go all the way? No, that's what I was getting at. Yeah, you got me back on track. No, I wasn't at all. No, I was going to go see my buddy Terry, Mm -hmm. who I hadn't seen in like four or five years. When I met Terry, so Terry Chandler is like, he's a fucking outlaw chef, you know, chuck wagon cook. He's got a burger joint in uh, Fort Worth called Fred's, Texas. When I met him, it was like this small joint over there on the west side where it was just nothing but like industrial buildings. And then he had this joint that his mom and dad started years ago and it was like just a badass beer and burger joint my wife worked there and i would just hang out and play washers and you know drink beers and Mm until she got off but he he had a beautiful thing and like what i loved about his restaurant was like it seemed like everybody that worked there enjoyed working there and he was real big on like creating an atmosphere that people wanted to be at you know like uh and people that worked there worked there for a long time you know like 
You can go in there today. It's changed locations multiple times, and there are still some of the same people at the new mm-hmm. location as there were 10 years ago. Damn. So it's still around now. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Nice. Yeah, he still owns it. And, you know, the story of him getting down there, it's, you know, he's a fucking, he's a surf bum from the South Texas, you know, at, you know, at the heart of it. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, so I go down there and visit him, and I show up on the beach, dude. It was like Easter week, which made crossing Central America a fucking nightmare. And uh, get on the beach. I got bottles of mezcal. They got fucking acid and rum. And, dude, we just camped on the beach for like three days. I learned to surf. It was a full moon. And, uh, dude, the first night, the very first night, you know, I kind of told him, why I made the pill. And dude, the first night was so cool because when I called him up like three weeks before that, I'm like, hey, man, I was looking at the map and I'm going to be close to where you're at in Mexico. I think I'm just going to come down. And he was like, and this is the first time I've talked to him in four years. Mm-hmm. I get a number from somebody else. I know he's in Costa Rica. Get him on the phone. And he's like, you're coming to Costa Rica on a motorcycle by yourself? And I was like, yeah. He goes, Man, that's fucking awesome. You know, and I was like, oh, this is, I got to go see yeah. him, you know? So when I get there, we're, I mean, we're literally just like, we can't look at each other and not smile, you know? Like, I mean, this dude, he's amazing. So, anyways, we're talking and I'm telling him like all these ideas I have and I want his blessing and I want his help. And he's like, yeah, man, you got all that. I will help you out however I can. But here's the thing, Dan, you just rode this Pan America. This new bike from Harley Davidson down the Pan America Highway, but it doesn't stop here, man. You got to go all the way to the fucking bottom. Yeah, and like he said it, and and I was shocked that I hadn't even, like it hadn't even occurred to me. I didn't even realize that I was on the Pan America Highway. Like I, you know, I know the Pan America Highway goes all the way down, but I literally crossed. Texas in Mexico, right there where the highway goes, and it goes right down there to yeah. Oaxaca. You know, there's so many ways to go through Mexico to get to Guatemala. Yeah. And I happened to go right down that motherfucker all the way to Costa Rica. And I still was like, hadn't even thought it. All I was thinking about was how I have to go through Central America again. And that yeah. was fucked, you know? And the thought of going to the bottom of South America honestly sounded easier than going back through Central America. <laughs> That's how fuck Central America was. Yeah. So I was like, you know. Uh, would you say it's easier now just to ship the bike to Columbia and then start there? I would suggest if you're going to do it, that's the way to go. Okay. You know, just because you have to fucking ship the bike there anyways. You know, like. Yeah. Unless you're going to spend a bunch of time in Central America, which you can. There's be- There's. I didn't. I, you know, I just fucking zipped Blast right through. through. Yeah. Until I got to Costa Rica and, and realized, you know, once I decided – yeah, fuck, I should do that, you know. He's like, isn't this what you do for a living? And I'm like, not exactly, <laughs> but kind of, you know. Yeah. Like, so, yeah, I mean, that. so I th- thought about it for like three days. I started riding on the beach, you know, like just kind of like taking notes of what the fuck had happened the past few days. And, um, yeah, so then I was like, well, fuck, you know, now I got to tell my wife, you know. like, <laughs> yeah. I didn't even tell my wife I was going to Costa Rica. Uh, she thought after the Mexicali Moto Rally, I was turning around and riding back to Texas. <laughs> and I called her up four countries later, you know. <laughs> uh, How'd she take it? Well, so, like I said, when I met her, mm-hmm. she was working for Terry. And she feels very, you know, she loves Terry as well. And I told her why. And she's like, okay, well, that makes sense. Um so I'm like, hey, here's the deal. The fucking the bike quit running. I got to come home and get a battery. How about you come back with me? Mm. You know, because as soon as I made this decision, do we like I was letting him and his buddy like ride around on the fucking beach. You know, like I was, dude, that's how I've been with that bike since I got it. I'm like letting everybody ride it. We rode it around the whole weekend. At one point, so the place where we were camping, we were the only ones that weren't locals there. Like mm. it was like natives, not just like gringo locos like I was hanging out with, but like native people but it's a great spot to like have your drugs come in off the coast oh shit! <laughs> okay especially that weekend when it's crowded a lot of people you know go get those fucking square groupers and bring them on into shore <laughs> so they see that bike and my buddy's riding it dude they fucking search the shit out of him because he went to the store and they just assume that you know that this yeah. bike had drugs on it and he tells me all this and i'm like 
fuck. You know, like I've got all the paperwork and yeah, I didn't have any dealings with the police until I got to Costa Rica and I was not going the speed limit at all anywhere. Mm. Not even close. Yeah. Cause you had one part where you, your license got lost where yeah. you were dealing with like some weird cop oh interactions my there. God. <laughs> yeah. So once again, it was like, it was Easter week. It's like Holy Week. What a, a sana men sana. You know, they got a name for it. But it's like the most busiest traveling time of the year for everybody south of Texas. Mm. And I'm at, uh, what border crossing was it? I was at on, the on. Honduras. Or Honduras? Yeah, I was in Honduras or trying to cross into Honduras. And... You know, I got a guy. You know, I've been paying people to help me out the whole time. Like, you know, the first bribe, I, I wouldn't even call it a bribe. I paid a guy like $15 or 20 bucks to help me do everything to get into Guatemala. You mm-hmm. know, because it's not like the Mexico-American border. Aren't those like fixers? Don't they have those in like all, a lot of border crossings all over the world for people? Or they they have the state ones and then they have the other guys. And so this is more like uh, this is the other guy. This is the homeless guy that can help you with your parking. They are making. <laughs> they are they are way better off than homeless people. Okay, mm. you know, twenty bucks goes a long way, and I yeah. wasn't the only guy he helped that day. Nice. I mean, I might have been. I don't know. Yeah. The other thing is, I'm like, this is, you know, 2022 travel like that hasn't really picked up yet. Mm. You know, like since. Were those those uh, those countries down there a lot more COVID worried or whatnot? Or are they a little bit more on? No, it? at this point, no. Okay, but I mean, to some degree, yes. So I would say that the countries south of Texas are more obedient. You know, like they believe exactly what the government tells them. Yeah. Whether they believe or obey might be two different things. You know, like I think they're more obedient. You know, like yeah. it's. Um, you know, because they probably have more consequences if they don't do what their government says. Not like here in America where we're, you know. We can just storm the Capitol. We can do really whatever <laughs> we want to some degree. You know, we're down yeah. there. They're like, when we say stay in your fucking home, yeah. stay in your home or we'll shoot you. You know, that's kind of how that shit goes down there. Yeah. Especially like in El Salvador. In El Salvador. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Honduras. So I'm at the border in Honduras. And so the way it works is you got to g- clock into the country. Yeah. You got to get your passport stamped to the, in the country. Once you get your passport stamped, you go over to another line to get your ve- your temporary vehicle import permit. Each country kind of has their own, you know, name for it. Like in Mexico, I think it's the Banjocito. Mm-hmm. So, anyways, I got a guy helping me out. I got two guys helping. Me. I got the guy from the street who got the guy from the, the helper at the border. Yeah. But the helper doesn't speak very good English. The guy off the street does. So, anyways, what they're doing is they're going, they're running, they're waiting in line for me at the vehicle, the vehicle line, while I'm waiting through this fucking line that's, I mean, probably twice the size of the bottom of your shop, and it's filled up with a line out the door. Mm-hmm. And it's just zigzags back and forth. And it's hot as fuck. The AC's not running. I mean, it's fuck. I'm like, wearing all my gear. They have... My fucking motorcycle title uh-huh. with them so that they can, like, get the paperwork started on the vehicle side. My bike's just sitting outside. And there's a lot of shit going on out there. You're like, mm-hmm. fucking shit everywhere. But one of the guys is hanging out with my bike, supposedly. <coughs> and I'm in this line that's taken for, I think I was there for two and a half, three hours. Do you have to have a title to get into these countries? Or, I mean, what if, like, say, what if you were making payments on your bike and there's no title aspect? Is that... Your broke ass shouldn't be traveling. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know. No, you could like in Mexico, you can just use the registration. Okay. Yeah. And I think you could have used the registration. I had registration and the title with me the whole time. Yeah. Seems like the title just works a little easier. Mm. Fuck. Maybe they were just, I don't know. I don't really know what was going on, Jay. So that's why I was paying these guys to help me out. Yeah. But anyway, so they're in line and, uh, Dude, in this line, I'm waiting forever. Like, at one point, there was literally a guy with a fucking mop behind me. Just, like, mopping up my sweat. Because I'm just, like, pouring out sweat. And right at the end, right, right before I got to the, one of the windows, these, this fucking old couple. Not a couple. These two old ladies. They walk in. They can't even, like, lift their head to look up at me. 
and I just let him go in front of me. I'm like, just, just, yeah, don't wait in that line. You guys will fucking die in this line. So I let them go in front of me, and a fucking eruption of pissed off people behind me like lose it and start fucking yelling at me. Some dudes like kind of smacking me on the shoulder, and I'm like. <laughs> No, like, no. Like, I would rather wait in line again than fucking make these old ladies. Yeah. Anyway, so I they go through. I get I do my stuff. So I go to the guys that were waiting in line at the vehicle in Port Deal, and I go to the window, you know, and there's, like, all these fucking motorcycle stickers on the window. I'm like, oh, I'm doing it, you know. And and he's like, go outside. And, and I'm like, okay. Oh, well, yeah, after I got out of that line, the first thing I did was walk out those doors to see the line was even longer than when I started. And my bike was there, you know, like with all my shit on it. I'm like, thank fucking God. So I go over there, talk to the guy, smoke a cigarette. And I'm like, all right, where's the other dude? He's like, he's in, he's getting the paperwork done. So I walk in there to the window and I see, uh, because I gave him my driver's license because all I needed was my passport. So he had my driver's license and my title. I go up there. He's at the window with the lady. I can see my title in my fucking driver's license. And he's like, I don't need you. You can just wait outside. And I'm like, fucking great, because this building sucks right now. And uh, I go outside, and I'm just sitting there waiting on him with my guy, like the street fixer. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the state-sponsored fixers in there doing the paperwork for me. And uh, and that dude comes outside, and we're sitting there on the, on the curb smoking cigarettes next to the bike. And I think we bought a bag of water, like a... Oh, yeah. Like a bag of water or something. A bag of soda. Or I don't know what it was. But the dude comes out, and he's like, um, here's all your paperwork. He gives me the registration, my title, the temporary import permit. And then he goes, um, do you have your driver's license? I'm like, no. You gave it. Like, I gave it to you. And he go, he's like, oh, I don't know about that. And they start arguing back and forth in Spanish. And the dude next to me is like, all right, check all your shit again. And I'm like, okay. And I, you know, I fucking pull out my fucking wall and all my shit. And I'm like, dude, I don't have my driver's license. The guy goes inside. Then he calls the guy next to me. He's like, hey, check your shit again. He can't find it in there. And I'm like, what? Now I'm like starting to really sweat. I was sweating earlier because it was fucking hot. Now I'm sweating because I don't have a fucking driver's license and I'm I'm deep. You how know? how uh, useful was a driver's license doing all this as opposed to just a passport. With, to get your vehicle import permit. You still have to have some kind of license. You got to have like a driver's license to like mm. say that you know how to drive a vehicle. Okay. So, yeah, I needed it. Like mm. that was, I needed that motherfucker. <laughs> and uh, so, but I have everything else. Anyways, I'm like, the guy, anyways, that goes on. They can't find it. They say that the lady behind the counter lost it. And I'm like... All right, will a hundred dollars make this motherfucker? Like, will a hundred dollars make my license appear? And they're like, no, like we really don't have it. So now I'm like, like I, you know, I was already worked up, like from just leaving my bike outside for hours. Now this happens. I'm like, no fucking way. So I call up Terry, and Terry just kind of laughs. <laughs> He's like, yeah, Central America is kind of like living in a nightmare. <laughs> like it's no big fucking deal he's like but what I would do if I were you is I'd go to the police station and get a police report saying that you had your license and you lost it you know or it was stolen or just say that you had your license long enough to get this paperwork but you don't have it anymore just so that you have a piece of paper when you get to the next border saying mm-hmm. that it's gone so I go there's a police station like right there in the same like you know we just walk to it it's right there and I got my street fixer and I got the state fixer. I go in there and the cops are just like sitting behind this desk, like playing on their fucking cell phone. Like just, just look up at us. Like, what the fuck do you want? And um, the guys tell him and I'm, I'm talking to him. They're talking to him. And, and he just looks at me in English and goes, the electricity's out. And he goes back to playing his phone. And I'm like, what the fuck? I look up, and there's, like, streamers on the air conditioner that are just blowing. You know, I'm like, what the fuck? No way. You know, so I I just walk outside, and I tell the guy, like, hey, motherfucker, that guy's full of shit, you know? Like, what's going on here? He's like, I don't know, man. They they just can't help us out. And I'm like, well, go ask him where the next police station is. So we go back in there. Pull out my phone. I'm like, show me on this map where the police station is. So they show me. It's like... 30 miles up the road. God damn. And uh, I'm like, okay. 
you know, and they're like, all right, now you need to pay us. <laughs> like, now you want me to pay you after you fucking lost my license? Damn. Uh, so I give them like, I don't know what I gave them then. And uh, I leave and I'm just like flustered, you know, like worked up, I'm sweating. I'm fucking like just amped. You know, I'm like, am I going to be able to get out of Honduras on yeah. my motorcycle? You know, like what the fuck? And uh, I get to the next town where the police station's at. <laughs> Roll through town, get to the police station. And there's like this courtyard, and I just pull right up in that motherfucker. Dude walks out of the deal, hand on the gun, and I'm like, oh my God, you know, like if I can stop. And I put my hands up. I'm like trying to tell him, you What's know, that yeah. it's okay. I, I understand your fear. I'm like all in black with a flamed out bike. <laughs> and uh, then a fucking another dude walks out. Uh, and then I get my helmet, like I get my helmet off. I'm like trying to like slowly reach in my pockets. And then this beautiful girl walks out and they're all in police uniforms. Like, damn, you know, and, um, uh, they don't understand anything I'm selling them. You know, yeah. like I'm trying to tell you, I need a police report. They don't fucking get it. And, uh, then this fucking fat lady walks out and she's like in office clothes. She's not in a uniform and her and the girls just start fucking going back and forth, smiling and laughing and looking at me. And I'm like, what in the fuck? And finally, she looks over at me. And she's like, will you marry your friend so that she can go back to Texas with you? And I was just like, no fucking way is this happening. Yeah. It was like the fucking Reno 911 of Honduras. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, did, I left out the best part of that whole fucking story. Huh. When I, in between the police station and the border, I'm like fucking going to that police station. And I come around a turn and there's like a mob of people in Halloween masks. With sticks in their hand, and they're fucking hitting the truck that's going right in between them. Mm. I'm like, no fucking way. And I just like, I can't even believe what I'm seeing right now. Like, I am in the nightmare. This isn't like, not. I mean, this is fucking crazy. Yeah. So I gun it. I ride straight into the middle of them. And there's like Donald Trump on my left. Donald Trump, or Barack Obama on my right. Both with sticks in their hand, and they're just looking at me as I drive through this fucking mob of people. <laughs> they were just as shocked as I was. and That's wild. I don't know, it just it would seem so for me, like it's something I really want to do, but I don't, you know, I feel like I would have to do it with like at least one other friend. Like, like I would suggest doing it yeah. with at least one other friend. For like one sure. other person that way. Like if we really get some shit, I'm like, well, thanks for doing this with me, but <laughs> you know what I mean. Like we're handcuffed. Oh, or, dude, all the border crossings would have been so much easier if there would have been like one person out there looking at the bike. Yeah, yeah. like me freaking out inside that building was like. It was hot, but it was mainly because I just gave my my driver's license and my motorcycle title to the same people that are watching my motorcycle outside. Yeah. Sit in the line for three hours knowing that at one point I called them up. Like I had their WhatsApp. I called them up like, hey, bring me my fucking paperwork right now. Like bring it all to me. So they come in with my fucking title and my driver's license and I'm in line and they show it to me and they're like, we need this to wait in the other line. And I'm like, okay, all right, fine. You know, like, I, but yeah. I was just like, I needed to, Need see, to see it. it I again. needed to know that you guys hadn't already fucking left. And yeah, dude, it was fucking brutal. So when you finally got to hang out with your friend, uh, you know, did you fly back home after that point? Once yeah. you hung out? Oh yeah. Yeah. What was the process of getting the bike shipped to, um, you know, where, where'd you go to, did you go to, Colombia is that did you have it shipped to there oh, yeah what? well from Costa Rica yeah you know, I went and got my wife brought her back told her that the trip wasn't over told flew her, her home told her you have another wife now yeah nah <laughs> you know uh I let her I put her on the beach before I told her that I wasn't coming home and uh then I rode then I went and saw Rob Rouser in Panama yeah and that was so sick dude and really once I left like, once I had made the decision, and I called up my buddy Randall. Rand, my buddy Randall Wiley, like, made this all so much awesomer than it could have been. Yeah. You know, he helped with flying me back and forth, making sure that I had funds in the bank to, like, really milk this whole experience. And I can't, I mean, he just made it fucking amazing. So once I realized that he was going to help me out, my wife was on board. Instead of, like, you know, because I did my house... To Costa Rica in seven days. Damn. That's a lot. That's a lot. How many dude. miles was that? Not very much, but it was like fucking eight or nine border crossings. Fuck. 
And, you know, the the first three days was, oh, like 1,800 miles. It's like you're just Mainly in Mexico. Basically. Yeah. You know? And then the rest was through all that other bullshit. These, these countries are pretty small, so, like, you can run through them pretty quick down once you Oh, yeah, I was doing, like, two borders a day. Damn. But it still takes all day almost to dude, get Dude, those border crossings, you don't want to do two a day during fucking Easter week. I guarantee it, dude. Weather okay while you were doing all this? Jace. <laughs> the weather was amazing the whole fucking trip. All the way down. whole trip. Nice. The whole fucking trip. I think I put on my my Carhartt rain gear like twice because it was raining. Mm-hmm. I put it on in preparation for it to not rain, or you know, like I, I dude, or I, I guess when I was like on the devil's trampoline, I wore it the whole time because it was just wet, you know. Like yeah. there was places where it was just like you're in the fucking clouds, you know. Like, but as far as like riding in the rain, yeah, pretty chill. What uh, I didn't do it. So you came back. I remember when you came back. Because I think that's when we did the... Yeah, probably while my bike was in Costa Rica. or my, I bet it was when I was in Panama. Because I flew back from Costa Rica, got my wife, flew back. Yeah. And then I spent like another three weeks going from Costa Rica to Rob's to Panama City. And then I left the bike in Panama City for like three months. Yeah. Remember that? And then you went back finally. And so, like I said, what was the process to get it from Panama City to Colombia? Just dropped it off the airport and flew there. Bogota. It was how much did it cost? Like was it super so, expensive? <clears throat> there was two options. You could ship it on a boat, uh-huh. and that was going to cost like five hundred dollars, and it was going to take two to three weeks. Mm. I talked to a guy at the same time I was doing it. He shipped his on a boat, and it took four and a half weeks to get his bike. Damn, for five hundred dollars, right? So that's pretty cheap. I paid eleven hundred dollars and got my bike in two days. I can't beat that then. No, <laughs> so what was fucked up is the guy Alejandro from Overland Embassy, who helps people ship. I mean, everything from like giant Overland vehicles to motorcycles. He was like, "Hey, it's going to cost five hundred dollars. We're going to put it on this ship, and you can pick it up in Cartagena." I'm like. Two weeks? Like, what the... F- Surely there's another fucking option, right? And he's like, oh, yeah, there is. But it's 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 a lot more expensive. It's $1,000. But you can pick your bike up in two days. I'm like, motherfucker, I will spend $500 in two weeks in Colombia. Wait, like... And I won't have a bike. You know, like, yeah. fuck that. You know, S- fly it over there. So you flew it over and you just caught a flight as well? Or did you take yeah. a boat? Yeah, okay. I flew... Yeah, I caught a flight as well. And then... Yeah, that's what I always wondered. You could probably just ship it out from, like, Dallas or maybe, like... Yeah, Cartagena is a... Yeah, you can ship yeah. it from Houston is where you ship it from. Oh, that'd be... Yeah, that'd be fucking rad, dude. Okay, it cost me $1,000. $1,100 to send my bike on an airplane from Panama to Bogota. hmm It cost me, like, twenty, a little over $2,500 to ship it from Buenos Aires to Houston. Damn. That's not bad either. No. You know what I mean? To have your personal, I mean, yeah, dude, that's not bad. I mean, you're, you're talking, like, that's the bottom of South America. I know. So. I know. I didn't think either price was bad. Yeah. No, I'd do that shit in a heartbeat. Be badass to, like, just ship it down there. And just, is it better to start down there or go down there? It Which depends you? on what your goal is. Okay. If you're going to do the whole South America, ship it to Cartagena. I thought it'd be sick to, like, ship it to Colombia, ride essentially west down and then ride some of uh, like Argentina and, and, the, and the the east side on the way up. Obviously, there's some areas you won't be able to really get through, like Venezuela and stuff, right? Like It's hard for Americans to go through there, isn't it? So I'm I mean, like, if it's hard for you to go to Mexico, Jason, it's going to be real hard for you to go to Venezuela, okay? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I feel like I'd be <laughs> – I don't know why I have this notion in my head that I feel like it would be so much less sketchy, like after you're you're out of like the Central America part. I'm sure there's the sketchy shits around Colombia and some of those areas as well, but you know, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it kind of depends on what your definition of sketchy is. Uh, the least amount of border crossings possible, the least amount of possibly getting fucked over kind of situations, you know. 
Because I feel like that's where all the fuckery is going to take place. It Well, it's, the fuckery happens when you're like me and you don't plan on doing it. Mm. And I didn't have any, you know, like there are, like I Overlander, I don't even think I knew about I Overlander until I was in Panama City. And that has like great information at each border crossing, what you do, who you give money to, how much it fucking costs. Mm. Whereas I didn't know any of that shit. And a lot of the border crossing Central America is like, go over here, give this lady $3 for this and fucking, you know, like it's. Well, it's good to know that there's a lot of different places that have information about this. So it's just kind of less of a, you got to know a guy that's done it once and get it through, like get the information that way more or less. Yeah, um, but it's, I mean. I'm not saying it's easier, but just the knowledge, you know what I'm saying? It, you know, that's one way to do it. Yeah. Is to like l- learn all that stuff before you go. Or you could fuck figure it out on the fly. You live a different life than a lot of people do. <laughs> you yeah. got danger dan glasses, like it'll figure itself out kind of attitude and I mean it always does though. For not for everybody, dude. Well, it for, depends on what your definition of like uh success is, really. Yeah, for sure. You know, but it's that, like can, a, that will be manipulated by the time you finish this. We trip. all know somebody who makes the worst decisions, but always lands on their feet. Are you fucking saying that I'm making bad decisions over here? I'm not saying here? they're bad. I'm saying that there maybe could have been better decisions. Yeah, you could have done a little bit more research. But yeah. what would that have gotten me? Uh, I don't know. Like I said, some people you can just don't. Fucking, you know what, man? I got to the Honduras border. You know, I paid this guy. I paid that guy. You know, I did the right paperwork, and then I just walked through. You know, I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I could have done it that way, but yeah. oh, I feel like you're you're the one that could pull that shit off because I definitely couldn't. I think I would. I'd be in there with looking that, like with that approach. You're right. Yeah, it's like if, it's like if you anticipate something going wrong, it's going to go wrong, kind of thing. Yeah, and that's kind of. I how would hate I would to cross, cross into Mexico with you with your attitude <laughs> yeah. right now. <laughs> it's like, I'm pretty sure I'd will it into chase. existence. Yeah, I mean, it'd be like going to Mexico with Big Meese. It's like, dude, they're fucking, they're going to seek you out. Like, honestly, it'd be better for me to have you with me because they're like, they're just going to look right over me and be like, we want that guy. You know, like, that's the guy. <laughs> what, uh, so as you started this, uh, this downward, you know, trek, basically, how did you plan for that? Like, what was the, was the idea just to run a couple? Of oh, countries? yeah. So once I, once I realized that I was going to go all the way to the bottom. You know, I'm riding to Pan America. I should just go down the Pan America Highway, right? Yeah. Nah. <laughs> no, I, you know, the Bolivian Death Road. Mm-hmm. That sounds like fun, right? Like, obviously, if I'm going down there, I've been seeing clips or hearing about the Bolivian Death Road for since I was, since I heard about anything in South America. So mm-hmm. I'm obviously going to go there. And, and from that, I was like, what are other dangerous roads in South America? So I fucking picked out the most dangerous roads in South America, and that's how I planned my whole How'd they hold trip. up? The Bolivian Death Road, you know, it was beautiful. Yeah. And yes, so the, the only reason it's not crazy dangerous now is because it's not needed. Mm-hmm. So, like, there's another road they built that's easier to go down, so it's not filled with trucks and tourist and it's shut down to bicycles and motorcycles Mm. so it was fucking cool now it was was really kind of ripping on on, on, like on the edge of a of a cliff or some shit or just like on the top of a rainforest sounds rad it's so good there's like (laughs) fucking waterfalls coming out onto the road it's incredible yeah (laughs) it's incredible um but as far as like dangerous roads like the so the first one i did was um what was it? The Devil's Trampoline in Colombia. Now, Colombia is fucking amazing, dude. Super, super fucking cheap, beautiful. The food was great. The hospitality, the places to stay were great. Mm-hmm. And uh, started in Bogota and started, and I just worked my way towards Medellin. And on my way to Medellin, the guy, there was a guy, this super rad dude, I think his name's Ruiz from Bogota, Harley Davidson. Mm-hmm. He reached out immediately, wanted me to come see him. Uh, they weren't open the day, or maybe it already left there when he reached out or found out that I was down there. We got a friend named Janelle, and I think she told him I was down there. So he called me up and was like, hey, stay out of the major cities, get off the fucking road, find a place to lay low. For a couple days, because there's an election going on. If the wrong guy wins the election, 
Mm. You don't want to, you know, so I'm like, okay. I found a sick fucking hostel. Dude, this hostel I found in a place called Guatape. This place Maggie Hicks told me about. She, uh, she just told me I needed to go to Guatape. So I go there, found a hostel that's got a recording studio, a fucking mini ramp. It's <laughs> like fuck? fucking cheap as shit. And it was, it was awesome. So I go there. I hang out with a bunch of French people, dude. There was like a whole bunch of French people that moved there and like started making their own fucking cheese and wine. And they had like fucking like, what do you call it? Like when you take duck. You, the, anyways, it was, it was awesome. I stayed there for like three days. Mm. I didn't get any work done. It was just like hanging out with rad fucking people. That's got to be one of the best byproducts of this is the, the, the people that you meet, especially the other people traveling and finding out more of their – their purpose to be on the road. Why are they here? What, Dude, Colombia was filled with fucking Europe. People from all over the world. Mm-hmm. Like kids backpacking through Colombia like you heard about people backpacking through Europe years ago. Mm. Uh, which maybe they still do, but I don't hear about that as much. But like, there's a bunch of Europeans backpacking. There's a bunch of beautiful women. To backpack there's there, a though. bunch of beautiful women from all over the world backpacking through Colombia right now. All their fucking... All the shit they own is on their back, and they're using public transportation. Like, in one of the places that was, like, the most deadly place on earth, you know, up yeah. until, like, five, six, seven years ago. <laughs> so, anyways, I met a bunch of these women. I bet I met a dude, a rad kid named Raul. Fuck. Of course, I would say his name's Raul, but I don't think that was actually his name. But you get... Sounds like a Raul. Dude, a super cat, rad cat from the UK. Uh, anyways, it was cool. So the election happens, everything's fucking cool. And there was a couple other people that got the same, you know, message, hey, stay chill for this mm-hmm. weekend. And I, I go to Medellin after that. Medellin is like a fucking crazy cool town. The traffic, the roads, like it's all fucking wild too. Mm-hmm. I got that was the first time I had to pay a bribe in South America. <laughs> There's like all these roads on the map and they're just they just do this. They're just fucking squiggly lines. So the train is it pretty mountainous and, and oh, like yeah. rainforesty kind of thing? Dude, it's fucking beautiful. So, like, in Colombia, it's separated by this mountain range. And then on one side, you got the Bogota Valley. And the other side, you got the Medellin Valley. And I started in Bogota. And then I met this dude on a bicycle. I remember hearing about him on your podcast. He was so cool. Yeah. Uh, But me and him both, we just crossed the mountains all the way down south. But I go to Medellin, and the Harley dealership shut down there, too. I didn't even stay in Medellin one night, even though I was told to stay there multiple nights. I just wasn't feeling the city. Like, I was having so much fun, like, outside the city, mm-hmm. and I knew what else there was to go look at. And I'm headed to the most dangerous road, right, which I had started making a joke out of because when I left Medellin, the roads that I was taking were like, you know, even before I got to Guatape, dude, I was on these crazy fucking roads, like, mm-hmm. where there's, like, people just jumping out of the fucking coffee farms. Like I'm, So I rode through, like, giant coffee farms and then like small coffee farms and just crazy muddy roads were like you know it was pretty i I wouldn't say it was sketchy but it was like you know technical shit and i'd be taking it easy just like looking around and then some girl fucking 12 year old girl would come ripping by on a 200 with her fucking four-year-old kid brother hanging off the back like not hanging on like juggling or something you know like whatever (laughs) like it was so fucking sick so going down to this road, I'm like, yeah. When people would ask where I'm going, I'm like, oh, I'm going to the supposedly most dangerous road in Colombia. Like, I never thought for a minute that it actually would be after going down some of the roads I went down. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I get south, and I, I cross back and forth a couple more times. Dude, there, to Colombia was fucking beautiful. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, I'm telling you, it was insane. And when I got to this, this spot where I was going to hit this road – Oh, yeah. I get to, like, this last town. I don't know any place to stay. Normally, I was staying at hostels, and people were telling me the next hostel to stay at, the fucking places to go. People at the hostel spoke English, even though they weren't from America. And uh, I get to this one town, and uh, I just picked the nicest building there because it was, like, not a, you know, it wasn't a touristy town like I'd been going to. Yeah, Picked the nicest hotel, like, get a room at the top for like fucking 30 bucks, you know, go downstairs and get a steak. It's a nice place. And you know, once again, Columbia is fucking cheap and there's a guy in like a suit, you know, except for he's the jacket's gone. The ties undone. He's feeling really good. He's sitting at the bar 
they're sitting at a table at the bar. He's got a big old bottle of Chivas Regal. And uh, the bartender speaks Spanish and English. The bartender tells me, hey, this man would like for you to sit down and drink this bottle of whiskey with him. I'm like, okay. You know, (laughs) if I can finish my steak and I go sit down with him. He doesn't speak any English, and I don't speak any Spanish. And definitely, I mean, I didn't speak enough to communicate with this guy, you know. I can order food and a room and shit. but So he ends up just like making the bartender come over and sit down at our table. There wasn't anybody else there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's like, man, this guy's on a four-day bender because he just won an election. And I'm like, oh, the election that I was, like, supposed to stay chill at, you know. And, and, you know, he's telling me about this guy, prominent lawyer, blah, blah, blah. The guy's pretty much, like, trying to tell me, like, why he's so badass. Or, like, you know. Yeah. You know, he's, I wouldn't say he was bragging, but he was just like wanted to know, wanted me to know who I was hanging out with. Oh, okay. And I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. So like, you're hanging out with a dude that just won the election that you had to watch out for? Yeah. That's fucking Very cool. Forrest Gump. Yeah. That you up just like, yeah, as soon as I finish my steak, I'll be over there to. <laughs> yeah, for real. Glad you didn't insult him kind of So thing. we drank that whole, b- oh, we're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> we drank that whole bottle of Chivas Regal and, uh. And I'm fucking standing off to the side smoking a cigarette because I am like, you know, we just drank a whole bottle. She was real. Yeah. And he comes up and just grabs me by the arm and drags me in the bathroom. And I'm like, no way. You know, like, obviously, you know, I drank coffee at this horse. I wanted to do some cocaine while I was in Columbia, but I didn't, you know, I wasn't going to go looking for it. You know, like, that's, that's yeah. how, you know, that's how you make the headlines. You know, like, fucking dumb American, you know. <laughs> But sure enough, this dude in this suit drags me in the fucking bathroom, pulls out a bag of cocaine, and I'm like, no fucking way. He dumps them out on my hand. I do the left nostril. He dumps them out on the other hand. I do the right nostril. I'm like, this is insane, you know? <laughs> he dumps the rest of it in his palm and just throws it at his face and just rubs it in like the fucking cookie monster. And I'm like, no, you just did all the cocaine. He's like, no, nah, no, nah, I got more. I'm like, no fucking way did this just happen, you know? Yeah. So we go back out. He orders the, the biggest bottle of Johnny Walker Black they've got, you know? And I'm like, this is insane. Then he calls in the fucking horse, dude. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> we get a couple more drinks in, and, like, the table, it's a small table. It is, like, two layers back of beautiful fucking girls that show up at this place. And I'm like, no way right now. Start talking to this one girl. She just got accepted to the NYU School of Art. She's a photographer and a model. And she was, she was, and she was paying for school that night. You know, she was working and, uh, and I'm just like, I'm, I'm like, now I'm like, I'm so drunk high on like in this cocaine down there. It's not like, have you done really good cocaine? Where, I haven't like, done any. Your face just goes numb. This was better than that. Like your face just disappeared. Like it didn't feel like it was there anymore. It wasn't like a numb feeling. It was like, I was like checking, you yeah. know, to make sure that. It's still connected. <laughs> Dude, it's insane. But then it got weird because he started getting, like, really aggressive with these women. Mm-hmm. And, like, you know, just playing outside the lines that I'm, like, able to withstand. Yeah. And I'm like, man, I can't even just, like, I can't. This guy, you know, they're, he's, like, the bartender tells me, like, yeah, he's got a room up. He's got the nicest room upstairs, which I thought I had. He's got the nicest room upstairs that has a fucking hot tub. And I'm like, I can only imagine where this is going, you yeah. know? Like, but I was just like, dude, I can't, like, he's going to fall and hit his face on something if I have to go up. Like, you know, if he's doing this out in the public and, and maybe it's more like accepted down there, or like, mm-hmm. I don't know. The guy was fucking on a four day bender, you know? Anyways, I just walked away. I just had to leave him. I was like, fucking just walked away. Yeah, that sounds about right. I mean, that. <sighs> I don't know, man. When in Rome, like, I don't know. I, I think I did the right thing, but I'm like, what would have happened? You know, like, where yeah. would that night have gone? It's crazy. He, he won an election, but he was alone, like no kind of security, nothing like that. I'm sure that he was just passing through this place or maybe he was just coming back to like his. I fuck, hometown I don't know. area. No, I mean, that. his hometown. I mean, maybe. You know, who knows? Like, I don't know. Maybe this was just one of his places where he has businesses. Because the place was like a business place. Yeah. Like, it was like, there was a lot of stuff in this town, but it wasn't like touristy. It was like, I don't know, that maybe there was manufacturing. Whatever there was, there was stuff going on, and these were worker people everywhere. Mm, okay. And then this was the big, this was the only giant white building that was a hotel. <laughs> 
So how long, like, how many different times did you kind of, like, do layovers where you would come back home? You know what I mean? On this so I went from Texas to Tamarindo, Costa Rica. Went home. Then I went from Costa Rica to Panama. Went home. Then I went Panama to Quito. Went home. And then Quito to Santiago. Came home. And then Santiago to Ushuaia to Buenos Aires. All the way down. Yeah. So when you were in uh, – in, um, Columbia, like how how long did you stay there versus like I mean out of all these states or I mean not states but uh, countries that you were in, like did it just get better the further south that you went or did it get more rural or like like what was kind of like the the concept here? Because I, I heard in some of your podcasts we were talking about like when you got closer to Patagonia, like the different you're running to these other bikers and things like yeah. that and. Yeah, it's just do this. Like I say, those imaginary lines. You would be amazed at like how much shit changes when you go from Colombia to Ecuador. Like it's just fucking totally different. In Ecuador to Peru, it's like really changes, and it's like yeah. So when you leave America, motorcycles go from being like a recreational vehicle to like a utilitarian vehicle mm-hmm. pretty quick, like. Mexico. There are people riding around for fun in Mexico. Don't get me wrong. But yeah. the majority of motorcycles in Mexico are like being used because gas is cheaper. It's a more effective, efficient way. You know, you can live in a shack and not have a driveway and still park your motorcycle somewhere. Yeah. You know, like so there's just more use. They're just there's a lot of motorcycles, but they're being used for work. You mm-hmm. know, then people aren't just driving them around to have fun like we do. Yeah. Uh and it kind of continues that way till you get to Columbia was the first time I started seeing like locals out riding motorcycles for fun. Okay. And then and then it kind of disappears again right as you, right as you leave Colombia and go into Ecuador and then Peru it's like fucking Peru there were so many fucking motors. I mean so many motorcycles and the cars don't even see you. The cars do not will not don't even acknowledge your presence in peru like yeah they just, just know that you have to get out of the way because you're on a motorcycle and they're in a car and they don't care what their car looks like yeah uh and that kind of stays the same until you get to uh argentina and then it changes and then it's like there's fucking bikers everywhere now when i hit argentina it's like it would be difficult like when i started looking you know as i've been paying attention to people that do like tours down there they don't do them the month that i was there because it's like high it's like their vacation month, mm. which was awesome for some dude traveling on his own because there were so many other dudes on motorcycles out with their buddies, you know, yeah, on the open road, fucking camping and fucking drinking and cooking out food. Like it was for traveling on your own. January is the month to go down there. Now, most of the tour companies go in like February or March. Like once those guys have all gone back to work. Now, temperature wise, like, is it sun, is it like super cold down there in this? Remember time? earlier when you asked me how the weather was? It's perfect. The whole fucking trip. Yeah, like literally, and I didn't like plan my trips back to America because the weather was bad down there. I just like I had commitments, you know. Like, yeah. and literally, without trying, I nailed it. Mm. Like straight up, fucking nailed it, dude. Even going through the rainforest, like I got there. So if you don't go to the rainforest during the rainy season, supposedly it's not as a pleasant as a time to be there because there's a lot of, like, plants that look fucking dead. You know, it gets dry as shit in some places. Like, obviously, like, really deep in there, it's, you know, it's yeah. just the rainforest all the time. But, uh, man, I nailed it. It was fucking... Peru That's was right. crazy, too, because, like, you go within a six-hour ride, same day, you go from desert up and over a fucking 15,000 foot pass down into the rainforest within a few hours. Damn. Like you just see the landscape changes so fast in front of you. Like, I mean, literally like you ride from a desert with cactus and sand to the, f- the most dense rainforest on the planet within hours. And you just see the land. Like you go up tall and then as you're descending, you know, you lower in altitude as the trees just start getting taller. Mm. And the lower you get, the taller the trees get. And next thing you know, the, the fucking trees are huge and there's vines and shit everywhere and fucking birds. And, like, there's just people out drying coca leaves everywhere. And then you just buy them and then you eat them. And How does that feel? Like, was that, like, in there like a, like a, uh, 
heard somewhere like when you eat them, it does something to you, right? Yeah. Is it good? It gets you so high. <laughs> no, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, that was obviously one of the th- obvious. That was one of the things I wanted to do while I was there because I'd heard about my friends that lived there. You know, always chewing on coca leaves. Yeah. Talk to people that have traveled through there where they give them to you on the buses because the, the the altitude changes so much that it, like, helps with altitude sickness. Mm. Um, so as soon as I could get them, I fucking bought a giant bag, you know, and then it was, like, underneath my cowboy hat, you know, on my back of my pack. That was always filled with coca leaves. But I wouldn't, like, you know, wouldn't getting high off of it. It was literally just, like, something to do, you know. Yeah. And it was crazy, like, seeing an old fucking lady, just old lady sitting on the curb with a big green bag of leaves, just, like, putting leaves in her mouth, you know. And, like, at first I was just taking a fucking handful of leaves and throwing them in my mouth. Then I found out, like, if you pull the stems out, you know, like, of each leaf and, mm-hmm. and feed it in that way, it's not as, like, it just like gets into a better ball, and then you find this stuff called yipta, made out of the the ash. Mm-hmm. It's like ash from some plants that they burn, and then they mix it with like high Andean women urine, you know. And they make this fucking like black tar shit. Uh-huh. And then you stick that in the leaves, and it breaks down the leaves a little bit more to make it more effective, you know, more cocaine like, if you will. And uh, you know, your mouth goes numb, like you get like a like a dental numbing agent. You know, that yeah. kind of, that's the kind of feeling you get in your mouth. But I never really, like, noticed any real effect until one day I climbed one of those passes without chewing on it. Mm. And you get, like, I was, like, fucking nervous or, like, nervous isn't the right feeling. But, you know. Anxious a little bit? Yeah, like, there was some anxiety. That's exactly what it was, like, anxiety climbing this mountain. And I didn't know what it was. It was kind of raining, and I'm, like, just wasn't feeling stoked yeah i guess you know it was like crazy when you see what you're doing and you're like not ex- not like yeah, there was more anxiety yeah. than anything else and then uh i guess oh there was like some construction so the, the traffic stopped and mm. filled up my it's mouth full of coca leaves and you know what help maybe i was having withdrawals fuck i don't know <laughs> like, that's what it sounded like to me you know, but, down. <laughs> but uh you know i know that that that's specifically like why they give it to foreigners is is it helps alleviate you yeah. know the tension from the lack of oxygen what would you say on this trip like south of like colombia was probably the most beautiful like the most like i'll tell you this when i ever since leaving texas on this trip specifically, not until I got to Argentina did I go, man, I got to come back here with my wife. I got to show my wife this place. Now, it wasn't just because of, like, the beauty of Argentina, even though that that's there. But it was also just, like, the, it has just enough infrastructure to feel comfortable, you know, where you're yeah, like, yeah. I'm not, I don't feel like I'm, I wouldn't feel like I was putting my wife in unnecessary danger or risk, yeah. you know. Um, not Colombia, maybe, but, it's you know, Colombia still is, like fucking Colombia, you yeah. know, even though there was beautiful women on their own traveling the country. But Argentina was like, it's definitely a place I will go back to. <clears throat> Argentina is probably a place I will ship a motorcycle back to and ride that country again. Mm. That'd be rad. What, uh, did you ever dip into Brazil at all? Nope. This? Didn't? What about, uh, like, no, I don't, I don't know Portuguese. Oh, shit. French. <laughs> Spanish either. Uh, yeah, I don't know, man. That, that's uh, so Patagonia. That's interesting, right? Yeah, I you know I've heard Patagonia. Patagonia's down there. So Patagonia is like the uh, the area, like the southern half of Argentina and Chile. Chile. So there's like a Pat- like an Argentina Patagonia and a Chile Patagonia, which I wouldn't really. I, I maybe I'm still not a hundred percent sure on that, but it's like uh, it'd be like the Midwest. You know, like there's a bunch of states in the Midwest. There's a bunch of landscapes in the Midwest. Mm-hmm. That's Patagonia down there. It's not like, it's not like a, it's not like a desert. There is the Patagonia desert, but like the, the Patagonia is just the area at the southernmost of South America. Isn't it like the Andes Mountains down there or something like that? I mean, the, there's Andes in Patagonia. Oh yeah, I don't that's know. what I'm saying. Like Patagonia is like referring to that part of South America. Oh, like you said, like. It's like, it's like we area. refer to the Midwest. Okay, I know. I get what you're saying now. That's yeah. Patagonia, but 
on one of your podcasts, you were talking like you had met some people, not maybe all the way down there, but you were some guys on a bike trip together and you started kind of bouncing around with them a little bit here and there. What was that like? You know, just meeting these people and riding with them some of these areas. It was or, sick. For real. It was fucking awesome. You know, like <laughs> meeting real bikers in Argentina was so fucking cool. Especially after the fucking people I rode with in Br- Peru, they were like, I mean, there were some of them, some of them were bikers, but like, they were like fucking hog members, you mm. know, they were like, hell yeah, brothers, <laughs> you know, they were riding their baggers, you know, they had all the Harley gear on all the leather, uh, you know, and they were super rad and they were so, they were a lot of fun, uh-huh. but then the bikers I met in Patagonia were fucking sick. These dudes from Argentina, like they were half of them were riding around on, uh, Patagonia Eagles, which is like an Argentinian Motor, it'd be like the Harley Davidson of Argentina. You okay. Know, like made in Argentina. There's a lot of pride in riding a Patagonia Eagle around. And it's a cruiser. It's not, you know, it's not a great bike for the roads down there. But, like, you know, they're fucking love it, dude. They're Set up it. like a chopper. And then I met Nico. Nico is from, like, Cordoba area. He fucking flew to Miami, bought a Sportster, rode it to key west then rode it to alaska and then rode it to ushuaia a fucking sportster Whoa. they just bought off craigslist <laughs> for fucking Those like things i don't know a few thousand bucks you were talking about like how was the, the money exchange on all these different countries like did you i mean you said that columbia was very cheap but did it stay pretty cheap all the way down or were there some areas where things got much more expensive and i wouldn't say it got like real expensive but Chile was expensive, mm-hmm. you know, like Chile. Santiago, Chile was like the most westernized city down there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was kind of pricey. I mean, when I say pricey, it was like as much as being in America. Okay. Right. You know, like, which seems expensive for down there. You know, not that it really was. Now, some of the places I stayed at were like kind of American prices, but like, do you know? Probably not as nice as what you would have gotten here, okay. but like down there, it seemed like you know. It's also like paying to be with a certain kind of people, you know, like finding those other travelers, you know, like the the places where people like went out of their way to curate a place for travelers. Mm-hmm. You know, those were pricier, but they also like brought you in touch with other people that were doing the same thing. So they were like worth every penny to like hear about what the roads were. In, you know, whatever direction those people came yeah. from, or just being able to talk to people in English, you know. Mm. How? What about gas? Like, how was it? Like, was it easy to find decent gas down there? Or was that kind of a What's decent gas? I don't know, like like premium? gas that works, like premium. I guess. Oh yeah, if you want premium, you just stay in America, buddy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got eighty two down dude, there, dude. <laughs> I ran all sorts of gas through that Panama. I ran all sorts of oil through that Panama. Oh my god, dude. Yeah. So, uh, other than the issues... I gotta go pee, dude. Okay, I'll go fuck myself. (laughs) Since you've dabbled in shipping the bike a little bit now, are there any other... Do you have any interest in going to maybe Europe or somewhere else that you would have to... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. What would be your first place in Europe to go? I mean, I haven't looked into it that much. I kind of want to go to Australia. Not kind of. I definitely want to go to Australia. That would be sick. And I got a friend with a chopper there. And if I would go to Europe, it would be Germany. Just because I got friends there and there's bikes there I could, you know, take advantage of. I don't think I would ship a bike to to Europe. Not at this point anyway. Yeah, I might ship a bike to Africa. Yeah. That's a good point with Europe. They're, they're, they're way more readily available than... Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And to like, put, you know... I, I mean, I guess you could fly it over there for, I just don't want to be without my chopper. Yeah. And the Pan American, you know, I don't know. I hadn't put that much thought. Dude, there's so much to ride around here. Like, Yeah, but now so that you much. knocked out two continents and then you said you've got the thing about Australia, do you have some sort of, now are you on a continent race? No. I mean, I'm not even on any race at all. I did just. A girl did just finish riding from Key West to Alaska to Ushuaia on her Pan America. Damn. And she lives right here in Frisco. 
Serious? Yeah. Fuck. Yeah, I know, right? Fucking. And you know, and I thought about it like, like on like when I was getting close, I'm like, am I gonna turn around and like, am I gonna have to go to Alaska? Yeah. Like, am I gonna like? Is that what I'm setting myself up for? Like, oh well, now you got to ride the Pan America to Alaska. But I didn't give a fuck. No, honestly, I thought it would be cool to like see somebody else do it, and it really was cool when I met this chick that just fucking did it. You know, like, yeah. Uh, and you know, I didn't even do it all in one stretch. You know, like I don't think I set any records or did anything. You know, yeah. Uh, well, I think it exposes that you can do it at different paces and different ways. It doesn't have to be this like all you know all or nothing kind of situation. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where I feel like. If you were to, you know, sometimes, or I know myself, if I was going to do it, yeah, I might have, if I was to go, if I was going to try to do it all in one run, then there's no way I'd be able to enjoy anything. Well, you right? miss a lot. Well, here's the deal. You know what I learned? Hmm. Is even doing it like I did, there's so much down there. Like, yeah. you could, and I've met people that, dude, they were spending months. Like, so when you get your typical, tier, t- typical, your temporary vehicle, permit for each country yeah some of them last three months some of them last six months some of them last a fucking year i met people down there that were doing this trip i don't i didn't meet any americans i don't think that were like tr- traveling the whole country or traveling the whole continent but dude there was people down there from europe and shit and they were literally staying in each country as long as their permit would allow damn like three months you know, I talked to one couple from Brazil, and they had spent the entire winter down in Patagonia, like with the ice out and everywhere. They were fucking camping in their fucking vintage Volkswagen Beetle, or not Beetle, but like a, the bus, yeah, yeah, the bus. It was so sick. They were on the side of the road with like the little tail flap open, so I pull over to see what's up, and they're like, "Oh, nothing." You know, we're just hanging out. I'm like, "Oh, cool." <laughs> so I just hung out with them for a while. They were fucking super rad. They put me on this sick trail called the uh, Carretera Austral. But they were like, they left Brazil like eight months before that, and they're headed to Alaska. God damn, that's dope. And they hadn't even made it to Bolivia. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, that's a different pace. That's yeah, a different yeah. pace. But, you know, the dude's like, he's got an old reliable van. He's got his fucking wife with him, you know? like Yeah, he's got it. Well, I mean, you're not. I guess he's probably not missing anything at home. You know what I mean? He's got it all with him, right? So exactly, it's yeah. I could I could probably go out on the road if like me and my wife were gonna go do something for a very long extended time. But even Would if you she, take your wife to South America, uh, I don't think I'd ride with her down there. But you know, I would do something. I don't know. I would probably do like South America proper with her in in some form or fashion. Yeah. But um, yeah, I don't know, man. Like I, I. I can't imagine, like, I'm not good with downtime. Like, I, I'm a have to always do something kind of guy. So it's hard for me to just be like, you know, I'm just going to chill in the hotel all day today. Like, it's not in my DNA. You know, I need something to do today. Um, so I, I don't know. I find it plenty to do. Yeah. So I, I would have to have shit to do, things to go see, things I want to experience. Um, but still, man, like, being gone, like, me and Jaden did a month last summer on the road and, I mean, I I was happy. I, I I was stoked, but every day we were somewhere. We were doing something else. We were doing another podcast, and we're going to a party at this dude's house. We're you know what I mean? Like, we literally rode here to basically San Francisco, all the way up the coast, Idaho, Montana. You know, broke off with the rest of the dudes, and then came and rode all the way back down to San Diego and did board free. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's like, you know, that was literally a month, and yeah, I was ready to get home at the end of it, but. At the, at the same time, it was every day had something. There was like, I don't even, I think we had one day that was a layover until we got to L.A. whenever we were doing the Born Free stuff. So I love that shit, but I don't know. I've been wanting to fly to go to Iceland and doing like that whole fire ring thing. Yeah. I just don't know if you could do it on a bike or not. If they rent the What would you do it on? I just rent a fucking vehicle. I just want to go in general. You know what I mean? Iceland. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not on my radar. Yeah, I, it's photography shit that it's kind of interested. It interests me to go there to, mm-hmm. to experience all that stuff and whatnot. But and it's cheap, man. You can go up there for like like seven to ten days. All hotels paid, vehicle rent. Don't do that. All, all hotels that. paid, all inclusive. 
Yeah, well, no, I'm just kidding. I'm a tourist. No, for real. Dude. That's the way to do it. That yeah. is the way to do it. We're going to fuck. You know what I was thinking? Huh? Is like Columbia would be a place where you could go down there and buy a fucking horse and tour the country on a horse. <laughs> just fucking riding around to different coffee farms. Yeah. You know, just the treatment I got on a motorcycle from America. Dude, if you rolled up to some fucking farm on a horse or just anywhere, any mm-hmm. restaurant, like. You're from Texas and you're on a fucking horse. Like, <laughs> come on in, just fucking put, put the, the horse, horse out to yeah. pasture. We've yeah. got you covered. Uh, on, on all and the- like, like meeting that kid who was on the bicycle, Sean Dronia. Mm-hmm. You know that seemed crazy to me at first, especially because the fucking mountains that he was climbing. And then I went down a mountain that was like, I swear it was like thirty-five miles of gnarly downhill. I was like, dude, how sick would that be to just be fucking passing cars and shit with no motor? Mm. Just like silence. And the way he would talk about like being on the road and it just being dead quiet. All he could hear is himself and the birds and fucking insects. And then all of a sudden an 18 wheel, they would just blow by him, you know, almost knock him off the road and then be quiet again. Yeah. It's like, you know, because that's what's cool about riding a motorcycle and traveling is like all your senses that get fulfilled Mm -hmm. on so like a car. We fucking, you get even more of that when you're on a bicycle because it's slower and you're taking it all in. And, yeah. You know, yeah. like you're really, I don't know. It, it no, nah, I don't think there's too many places to ride a motorcycle yeah, that I would yeah. want to do first, but I, I, it opened my mind to the thought of like that could be enjoyable. Well, anytime I've been traveling across country and you'd see like the bicyclists out in just in America, like it's, it's been enticing to me. It's been something like that. I don't really care for the riding bicycle aspect, but just that pace seems kind of See, America's too wide open for that shit, or at least out west. Yeah. But, like, down there where it's, like, every day there's just fucking mountains place. and fucking yeah. hills. and. What about uh, the roads in, in general? Like, did you ride on any roads, you know, Columbia down that you would say, you, like, you couldn't have – could you have done your on your chopper, do you think? There was a route – yeah, you could definitely do it on a chopper. Okay. Uh, highway 40 would be fucked But like You couldn't go the way I went on a chopper No wow. fucking way dude uh, No way But there is a way to go yeah. Was there, is, is it Is there an option to go concrete Pretty much all the way down Oh or, yeah or, Yeah the okay. Pan America Highway is like Paved almost the whole I think the whole way Until you get to Argentina mm. Yeah like Argentina is the only spot that doesn't Yeah I think Argentina you know, in the Darien Gap, obviously, there's fucking yeah. nothing there. But, uh, yeah, easy, <laughs> easy. But, it's you know, to be down there and not be able to go on some of the roads I went on. Yeah, and I guess because I know about them now, especially. But, you know, you would just be limited, you mm-hmm. know, like. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's one of those things. It's like you're going to – it's like the, the concept of taking – actual old route 66 overtaking interstate 40 it's like it's taking you through the land uh, with it as opposed to just around everything to make it quicker you know what i mean yeah, so exactly you're Pan america highway just goes with know, the land is the easiest way to go oh yeah, yeah. through it yeah but yeah but, i don't know man like that's a i mean there is a i mean the most dangerous road i did was in peru it's called 8b and it was fucking insane and it was one of like the roads i read up about that like It didn't even have that much written about it. It just made the list. And, dude, it was fucking crazy. But it was paved. That was one of the the, the roads on the list. I think there was two roads on the list of most dangerous roads that were actually paved. Mm. And one of them wasn't even dangerous. It just you could take a good picture. It's that road outside of Santiago where you just see, like, fucking tons of switchbacks. But the road in Peru was fucking nuts because it would be as wide as this table, like where a fucking truck is, like, both wheels hanging off the pavement, and then it would be as wide as two lanes. But it was just blind turns, and everybody's hauling ass. Because it's paved is what made it so fucking gnarly because everybody's going so fast, and mm. there's not enough room for the traffic to squeeze by. I ran two cars into a cliff, and I almost went off a cliff trying to pass a fucking a dump truck that, like, the road just disappeared next to him, and there was a cliff as I was going around him. Fuck. It was fucking crazy, but... That road would be fucking sick on the chopper. Mm. Uh, but I wouldn't do that road again by myself. There's no fucking way. It was sketchy. I don't know that I would do it again unless somebody was like, hey, I want to go ride that road. Will you go with me? And I'd be like, okay, but you have to be up front. You know, like, 
Let him make it was mistake. so fucking gnarly, dude. Like, <laughs> that was sick. I mean, most of the traffic on that road was like three wheel taxis, like little dirt bikes with two wheels in the back and like mm-hmm. a covered cab or trucks. And I found out that the, the day that I went down, it was like the day all the trucks go to market and they mm-hmm. go the opposite direction I was. So it was like the worst time to ever ride it. But it was fucking yeah, yeah. killer. The views and shit like that. Oh, dude. I mean, at one point I got like, my dumbass got to the beginning of the road and it was like only a couple hundred miles or some shit. So I'm like, oh, I can make it before the day's over. Mm-hmm. No, dude. I should have stayed with my plan to stay in that town before the road started. But I took off and then it like, you just leave everything, climb to the top of this fucking mountain. And then you just stay on the top of like the spine of the Andes. Mm. And there's just nothing up there. And finally I came to like this little restaurant hotel. Or it wasn't a hotel. It was like a restaurant. And I was like, dude, all I could see were storm clouds up ahead. It was starting to get dark. And I'm like, dude, this is this road is not safe if the weather's perfect. You yeah. Know? yeah. <clears throat> so I stopped and got some supplies. And I was going to find a place to camp. So I leave that spot. And I take off, and there's, like, literally, there's no side of the road. Like, the side of the road is the mountain or the fucking cliff. So, for, like, I don't know, 30 minutes, I'm, like, just looking and don't see any place to, like, set up camp. So, I go back to that place where I got the the drink. I think I got water. and Oh, that's where I got the moonshine made out of coca leaves. <laughs> and... uh so I go back there and I ask the guy, I'm like, hey, dude, there's like a little piece of grass over here. Can I stay here? And I set up my tent. And he was like, no. One second. And he goes inside and he gets a key and like fucking unlocks this fucking shed that's like, I mean, who knows how fucking old it was. And uh, I stayed in some wooden shed on the side of this fucking road. And it was it was awesome. Uh, was out. there a storm passing? So you got to Oh, yeah, that yeah. Out. It yeah. rained for sure that night. And then the next morning it was that, that was such a good move because the next morning it was clear as fuck. Watch the sun come up over these fucking mountains, and then I could actually see how many mountains were out in the distance, and it was so sick. What about, like, did, did you take a GoPro and capture a lot of this, like any camera stuff, uh, drones, all that mm-hmm. stuff? Yeah. Yeah, I'm terrible about stopping and putting the drone in the air, but I took GoPro. I got fucking hours and hours and hours of GoPro footage. Uh, mainly it's all from my helmet cam. Yeah. You know, Grand Teton has all that. They do. Okay. Yeah. They put out, they edited a lot of it down for that video, but they haven't edited or I haven't sent them the last bit of it. Dude, I don't, I have a ton of footage that Mm -hmm. will probably never go past my kid's eyes, you know, until I find somebody to do something with, you know, I'd like to fucking make a book of this trip. So maybe I'll like, at that point, use the footage to... Yeah, it'd be cool if like, someone did edit down like the whole thing, and then you could watch it, in a sense, and almost do a voiceover yeah. with a lot of it, and then create something in that kind of realm of, you know... It's insane to me how the fucking well some of those videos do, where they're just like... Yeah, dude. It's just like a fucking chess cam and some dude talking about it. I mean, I guess that Desperado Run video we did, we threw together. I had somebody put the podcast over the video, and it's been watched a couple times. Dude, I, I've been a big fan of, like, the Blue Todd stuff ever since I, I saw you on his thing the first time. And then I well, watched that's it. a little different. It's different. That's but it's way different. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's much, much better at it. But I can't believe you're comparing that to my No, I'm just saying, like, in general. Um, but, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Oh, like, I would have loved to have Todd on that trip just yeah. documenting the whole fucking thing. I mean, come on, dude. Uh, what was it? The Yeah, well, those kind of things, when people start traveling out of the country and doing that kind of stuff, I think it's just – pretty interesting um for anybody to watch and i mean it's understandable not to literally have a whole camera crew with you to be able to i mean long way up had it or i think it was long well, way it's up. just a different way of traveling i would love to find somebody like like brian helm i took yeah. brian helm down to ecuador with me you know i need somebody not need but it'd be nice to have somebody that's as cool as brian or as cool as any of the guys arriving it'd be fucking sick if you know, Nick was a, you know, somebody as cool as Nick was a professional yeah. video guy. Because I think there's a way to do it where you're not, where all you're doing is adding to the trip, you know, capturing some good stuff, making some cool edits, yeah. you know, and putting it out there. Because, you know, you can't capture it all. And I think that's where a lot of video people get hung up is they're like, 
oh, we got to capture this one shot. It's like, no, nah, what the fuck? On a trip like that, you can't. we can't stop and film all the cool shit. Yeah. Trust me. I have hours of the cool shit. You can, like, the, what do you even do with it? You know, like, but like, you know, take advantage of the morning and the evening. Yeah. You know, capture some shit throughout the day and fucking, you know, it'd be cool to have somebody that was like, that was doing that. Yeah. Just, yeah. just short stuff, you know, maybe stuff that got put into a long format at some other point. It's the editing, dude. That's the biggest thing is like, you know, on a trip like that, you're fucking just saving the, you're getting the stuff during the day and backing it up at night. Yep. You know, even with taking photos with Brian in Ecuador. Each night, I was like, all right, I got to back this shit up, you know, mm-hmm. uh, which is fine. You know, he'd pull out a video or, a, you know, a photo. Or t- Dude, we have some sick photos that have never seen the light of day. I'm like, he's like, what are we going to do with them? I'm like, I don't know yet. I don't know. You just say, just fucking hold on to them, dude. Just hold on to them. Yeah, that's, you know, like, that's kind of my, my next move as well, like trying to push more video content, um, which I've fought against it for so long. But, you know, I'm just... I had to find something that I, that inspired me to want to do it, and I kind of finally have it. Um, but yeah, What's it's that? still. What's the inspiration? Uh, I, I really can't put my finger on exactly one thing that's the inspiration. It's just that, like, I have all this camera equipment. I love photography, and I feel like we live in a world right now where it, it's really hard for ph- photos to 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 capture people the same way it used to. Which I'm always going to be a photographer or a lover of photography over everything, but just feeling like I have to capture this life that I get to live in a way to show people it, who, who cares, you know, I'm not saying it's like, you know, everybody's got to watch this shit, but I just want to capture it. You know, our friends group, when we go on these trips, these, all the things that we do, it's like, I want people to see this, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And whether they find inspiration to it to where they want to travel or they want to do these kind of events, like, whatever the purpose is, but I've just been trying to force myself to make that kind of stuff. Like I took a, I wouldn't say I took a, I didn't stop taking fo- photos like photography wise, but I've told myself this year, I'm going to focus 70 to 80% focusing on video and then leave the other percentage to photography. And, um, we started the YouTube thing a, a couple weeks back and, uh, it's it's going it's it's doing pretty pretty decent but it's like it's nowhere near where I want it to be right N- knowing all the videographers that I know and the photographers like I have a a vision of how I want it to how I want to tell these stories and I'm not quite good enough yet to tell them the way I want but practice right yeah. we have our camp out coming up next week and we've had so much content like real like reels kind of content made for it over the years but it's never got a proper like video like this is the experience this is the vibe and so i felt like you know what if i want to dip into this that's what that's the biggest event that we host that i should be making something spectacular out of this so these other videos are kind of practice to kind of to to reveal all the different things i need to pay attention to at the camp out does that Mm -hmm. make sense yeah practice inspiration though it's like um I don't know, man. Like, I hate to say it, but it's just like video is just consumed more now, you know? And as much as I don't really care about making vertical content, you know, reels and stuff, it's like if I'm going to get in this video aspect, I'm going to start making videos, I want to make something special. I want someone to watch it for more than a minute. I want it to tell a, a, a better story. I'm not looking for clickbait. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I want to I want to show things in, in the best way possible that I know how to at least, you know, and well, there's a lot of it out there and a lot of it gets yeah. consumed. Sometimes it blows my mind when I stumble across something and yeah. I'm like, fuck, <laughs> this, this, this has been viewed a lot. Yeah. I mean, I, I've never, I never really wanted to, I mean, let me phrase this right. The last couple of years I consume a lot of YouTube. I watch a lot of photographers, videographers, obviously podcasts, a lot of different shit on YouTube, but I, I always stay away from motorcycle content. Right? Really? Just, and I don't mean to say this in a way that's like, a, like it just hasn't, it hasn't done anything for me, right? Uh, but there are people out there that do rad shit. You know, uh, Tulane Life does really great high production quality videos and they capture the shit really nice and they tell a great story. Um, the Blue Todd stuff has always been very fascinating to watch the way he kind of run and gun captures some of these things, you know? 
Uh, there's a handful of other people out there that I feel like really, I could sit there and listen to them just as much as I could watch them because mm -hmm. they're really good at speaking and telling the story in the, in the correct way. But as I've started like down this path, I'm, I've allowed myself to watch other YouTubers a little bit more. And I wouldn't say that it's anything bad. It's just, it's, it's insane to me how like this video will have like 150,000 views on it. And it's literally like some old white guy in his garage with his electric glide. And he's just giving his opinion about the new Harley Davidson's that haven't even came out yet. You know what I mean? And it's just like crazy how much people out there just consume YouTube content. And I'm one of them. So I was like, well, you know what? Maybe I can try to put my, 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 you know, try, just try, mm -hmm. see what, see what happens. You know what I mean? But, YouTube's also kind of a, a rough place. <laughs> people are kind of, they have no filter on there. Like you, Instagram, people, they're a little bit more humanized on Instagram. YouTube, you click on that person that just said that fucked up shit. They don't have, they just have a, like, they're just a, like a, they don't have a page, a profile. They didn't put content on. They have nothing for you to kind of go back on them and say, you know, you're a piece of shit too or something like that. You, you gotta know? just post and ghost, Jay. That's what I do. I, I do look that. At that shit. But it still exists, you know. Yeah, I don't. I mean, the the thing about YouTube is that you you kind of have to engage in comments because comments and likes are the are, are what drives your video to be in the algorithm, and like like when when you finally have a video that hits something of that groove of the algorithm, then you're like fuck, like that feels really fucking good to see like the video the the podcast that we did with Matt Jackson and we put it out there, it fucking hit some kind of algorithm because it went skyrocketed on views and i had a lot of positive feedback on it and that's what gave me that i guess the confidence to take the next step a little bit you know mm -hmm. what i mean um but yeah it's like you you you're supposed to engage in comments in a way that lets youtube know hey people are interested in this and so youtube takes it and shows more people so I've kind of been the guy where, like, I don't comment anything. And do you, uh, do you like, have commercials on your podcast? I do on like the, the audio. On the, on the YouTube. No, not on the YouTube. There's Just, no, like, you don't monetize the channel? Well, it's monetized through YouTube, but it's... That's what I'm talking about. You don't really get that much money. Like, you so got they sell Viagra at the front of your commercials? Much, probably. I've never... I pay for... <laughs> I pay yeah. for the premium, which I, I tell people all the time. It's like, premium YouTube... Is worth every fucking penny. What is that? So you just don't have to watch commercials? No commercials. You can actually like play a video and just turn your phone off and just listen to it. So a lot of podcasts, I started doing it that way because, you know, it's I just dig it. You know what I'm saying? And since it's premium, I don't have to deal with any of the ads and whatnot. And I watch so much stuff on YouTube all day long, working, sitting at the desk. It's like, fuck yeah, I'm not going to watch a commercial every fucking three minutes. It's just a waste of time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like. I watch YouTube more than I watch any other streaming service that I have. Netflix, you know, even at home. I'll go home and sit on the couch. There's nothing on Netflix or Prime. I'll put on YouTube. Watch uh, the history of Route 66. It's more interesting to me than fucking, what is it, Wednesday? The, you know, some other TV show on, on Netflix that, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been listening to books. Oh, I've been listening yeah, to one yeah. book, like, on fucking repeat. For real? Which one? The Blood Meridian. What's it about? Some fucking, it's like a kid who gets hung up with some crazy fucking outlaw scalp hunters in Texas and Mexico back in the 1800s. True. It's, you know, it's like, a, what do they call those? A historical fiction, mm. you know, where okay. the shit that, it's a lot of the stories are based on like real life characters. The kid is like loosely, seems like some of his stories based on a guy named Bigfoot Wallace, who was one of the first Texas Rangers. Mm. It's fucking good. The guy, Cormac McCarthy wrote the Same guy that did uh, No Country for Old Men and The oh, Road. Oh, shit, that'd be badass. The Passenger. I mean, they've tried to make it into a film like three times. Three or four times. Scorsese tried to do it and like. It was too rough. <laughs> dude, it's, well, it's a fucking gnarly book. It's fucking <laughs> real gnarly. Uh, I've been reading a new book to my kids that I just got from a guy named J.B. Zilke. Mm -hmm. This dude like cowboyed in six continents. You know, went to Argentina, fucking Australia. He was chasing wild fucking bulls around the bush on dirt bikes. Just <laughs> fucking getting them tired, throwing them down and hog tying them. Damn. Dude, it was, it's good. It's, it's, it's a good fucking book. Uh, 
you know, kind of like I've been digging a bunch of Indian shit lately. Like I just did 11 years in Indian. Right now I'm on, uh, oh, something moon. Something. Empire of the Summer Moon? Yeah, Empire yeah. of the Summer Moon. Yeah, we read that one. Uh, audio booked it. That was yeah. the one that Rogan was raving about for years. And I oh, finally really? listened to it. He had the uh, the Arthur on the podcast. It was pretty good. SC Gwynn or something like that. Yeah. It's a great fucking book, dude. It's done a lot like uh, putting in perspective how gnarly the Comanches were. You know, One thing did? I couldn't figure out like over the years is like why they enjoyed the plane so much. You know, and it wasn't like they were such a gnarly group of Indians. Like, fuck, they could have been anywhere, right? Like, yeah. they could have. Those they motherfuckers could have whooped any other fucking Indians' asses and taken over their land. But what that book finally explained to me was like how efficient they were able to 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 travel in the plains. You know, like if you think about being in the east or any place where there's mountains and trees, which is one thing I've started to realize why I like the desert and the you know the openness so much is because you can see so far. Yeah. So like giving somebody directions in you know, Eastern Tennessee, like 2,000 miles away. Like, hey, there's no real landmarkers, you know? You're just seeing yeah. hills and fucking trees everywhere. But once you get to the plains, you can, like, you can tell somebody how to go 3,000 miles that direction because there's so many landmarks that you can see from so far away to keep people on the right track. Yeah. You know, to where they could send a fucking group of warriors, like, hey, go to this spot fucking 2,000 miles from here. You know, the other side of Texas. Where else in the country can you send somebody except for, like, you know, south of North or South Dakota, you know, where you can see far enough to, like, yeah. hey, go that way towards the sun until you see the rock on the left, you know, and then go <laughs> south. Uh, what that book did for me when I read it was it, it made those trips through, like, certain parts of Oklahoma, Kansas, and Nebraska – uh, you know, West Texas, like way more interesting. You know, some of the towns that you'll go through, some of the counties or some of the names of some of these uh, people in the books. Yeah. And it, to me, it just like opened up, like made it interesting. It's still, that, that's one of the things that people talk about all the time is like these different parts of the country. It's like, oh, it's riding through Kansas is the worst. And I'm like, it, yeah, it's compared to like. It's not the best. Yeah. Compared, <laughs> when you compare it to like other places that are rad, it's like, yeah, it's always going to be that. But, I feel like there's different things about every state that makes it unique and fun to ride through, and you just kind of tap into it a little bit. I'm never going to say, like, yeah, I would prefer to ride through Kansas over Colorado. I'm never going to say that. But Kansas is on the way to a lot of places that we go. So it's like I got to learn to fucking like a this A lot place. of places or, like, one place? One place. <laughs> but it's a lot. <laughs> no, I agree. And, uh, you know, it's all about the perspective. Uh, riding through – you know, any trip, mm -hmm. you know, like I'm not going to say his name because I was It kind of, you know, I'm going to have a talk with you about this, too. You probably won't hear this, but I'm uh, my buddy showed up at this last run. He's like, man, I and he trailered his bike, which is fine, yeah. you know, but he was like, yeah, I put my bike in the trailer and I counted the amount of enjoyable miles on my trip here. And there was only 13 miles out of 500 miles that were enjoyable. And I was like. What? You mean like what? The view is enjoyable or like, you know, what, what, you know, that's just like a terrible attitude to have. Like if you'd have been on your bike though, you know, you wouldn't have been looking at that shit through a fucking screen. And because of those, some of those miles that aren't enjoyable, those are what make those 13 miles or whatever the fuck you want to count them up yeah. as that much more awesome. You know, like you can't, they can't all be beautiful. Yeah. And like that's one thing like. This whole trip through South America just like really sent home is like how everything comes in waves. And like even when you're down there, like if something good happens, you better be ready for something shitty to happen after that. You yeah. know, or if like if shit starts getting really fucked up, well, it's going to get really good after that. Like it just yeah. and, it, and it's only the extremes are, you know, the good is only available because there's really bad out there. You know, yeah, like that's sure. just that's just how it works, you know. And that perspective is what makes those good things that much better. Is because you you saw the opposite of that. Yeah, you know, trying to trying to convince people that are used to trailering bikes everywhere to to get out and do it. I mean, don't get me wrong. Everybody, the people that say they trailer a lot, they they have their reasons, right? Maybe they only have this much time off of work. Uh, 
maybe they're going to Daytona and they're coming from New York and it's snow on the ground. Like, there's a lot of things I understand. You're saying that's not a good excuse? No, I'm saying it is a good <laughs> excuse. I, under, I Like, I get it. I yeah, get yeah, is what I'm yeah. saying. But what what I just I, – I try to tell everybody, it's like, man, if you could just try to – Try to go enjoy all these different aspects of riding, right? Because, like you just said, you know, we, we have people leaving their houses right now to come to Oklahoma for our camp out next week. Mm-hmm. And there's storms all over the country, some snow, some just gnarly storms. And we always tell people, like, these storms are part of the experience of coming to this camp out or coming to like this I, event. I designed it this way. Yeah. Springtime, I want you guys to ride through fucking tornadoes to get to this yeah. camp out. Well, the thing is, is like, when you have a day, and everybody said this, the, the, the experience it, you'll have a day of like the rain never stopped, and then you finally get to the campground, and you see everybody down there like they're fucking here, and like you're just like all of a sudden all that shit doesn't matter anymore. No, no, it makes you're, all the shit in front of you that much more exciting. Yeah, because you just went through fucking shit to get there, and now it doesn't even matter. It can still be raining there. Yeah, but you made it. You know this last. Uh, so EDR is coming up. Mm-hmm. And two years ago, I went there with uh, a group of fucking great people. I went with Gary, Big Mies, Nick, Al. And I guess that's it. Fucking Kickstart Mike fucking bailed. And Rob broke down at the border. Seems like I'm missing somebody. Anyways, we go. You know, this is what we ended up calling the Desperado Run. I mm-hmm. think Mies gave it that name. We ride through Mexico, hit the... Ferry, go to the bottom of the Baja and ride up. And, you know, I kept telling everybody, like, all right, we may not make EDR. You know, like, we may not make it. Like, we're, my goal is to, like, ride across Mexico and take the ferry and ride up Baja. If we land at EDR the weekend of the event, then cool. Well, we ended up taking the ferry, and we were had, like, three days to get to EDR. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot to do on the Baja, you know, like there's a lot to do. And at first, like if I, if you'd have told me that at the beginning of the trip, that when we got to the bottom of the Baja, we'd only have three days to make it to San Felipe. I just said, we're not going to make it to San Felipe. Yeah. Cause there's some shit I want to do down there. But like having that as like the ending point, like something to shoot for just made that like, and, you know, like getting someplace and feeling accomplished and like having people there to like be to party with when you get yeah. there. Like it made it. We blasted up the Baja in three days and we rode all day long, all three days. It was hot as fuck. Dude, at one point it was like it was like riding into an oven. Like I remember <laughs> like we're cutting across the Baja. It's fucking, you know, it's the desert and the roads like fucking perfect. But there's nothing out there. And then all of a sudden I see the ocean out there. And I'm like, oh, there's going to be like cool wind that comes with that. dude. And we're just riding towards it. And it just got windier and fucking hotter. And it never got cooler. It just got hotter. It was like riding into a fucking oven. Yeah. And uh, and it was awesome. By the time we made it to San Felipe, it was so fucking amazing. You know, like the shit that we went through to get there on time. Like I was like, it just made me realize like having that as like a, having a goal and, you know, like a mission to, you know, to just ride down there and, oh, go see the beach here and there. But, like, having a goal to, you know, push us through some shit where we could have just pulled over and, like. Said, fuck it. No, yeah. fuck it. We're just going to. St- when we get to that water, we're going to go get in it. Yeah. Which I did do that, too. Like, I literally stopped at the water, walked out into the ocean and got back on my bike and was like, we got to go. <laughs> <laughs> but we could have just hung out there and fucking got beers and, and hung out on the beach. And it had been fun, too. But, like, having a goal a mission, a place to be, people to see, you know, really, you know, it's just made an impact on me, like how and how I like kind of plan these trips now. Mm-hmm. We're now we're going fucking earlier so that we got like fucking six days to ride up to Baja this time, yeah. if everything goes well. Uh, but dude, half the groups all bailed out. Everybody's got excuses, you know, bikes aren't running right, yeah. which is pretty typical for a motorcycle trip. Yeah. But over the past few years, I've been pretty good with, like, limiting the amount of people. You know, everybody's like, well, I want, you know, I got a friend that wants to go. I'm like, you know, fuck, I got a friend that wants to go. But Do you think that, like, because uh, I've always had this, but maybe, maybe you have a little bit of this, too. Like, there's a lot of rides where you can just literally do it every year or every other year, like BDRs every other year mm-hmm. or El Diablo Run, EDR. Uh, 
Like, I'm one of those guys, like, I can ride to California every year, rest of my life. I can do Sturgis every year, rest of my life. New York, I can do that every year, right? Some people are like, oh, man, you know, like, I don't know if I really want to do that again. You know, I've already done it twice or, you know, three times or once. I'm just, you know, that way where it's like I feel like if every year if I ride in California and I ride East Coast and I get to go to Sturgis, then I'm like, fuck, I'm, I'm living my motorcycle dream, at least the dream I have now for it. Are yeah. You, do you feel like any of that applies to you with like certain things, certain trips? No, I do it all. I don't yeah. think there's enough time. Yeah. You know, I, <laughs> no, I. But do you uh, get like withdrawals from certain parts of the country that you spent time and ridden in where you're like, man, I really want to get back over there. You know, like all the people that you know in these areas or whatever the case may be. You know what I mean? Uh, no. <laughs> no, I mean, I. Uh, there's people everywhere. Like, I think that's. I think the hardest decision now is where to go. You know, like I got so many places I want to go, so many play people that I want to go see. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> like, I guess one thing that comes kind of bums me out about the people that are backing out on this trip now. Not that they don't have the reasons, whatever. Yeah. But I'm like, I was going to a place that I'd been to before. Now I'm going there a little bit different way than I went before. But I was going so that I could show these guys this place that's so fucking awesome. I'm like, fuck. If all these guys aren't going, you know, like it's risky going to this place, you know, like yeah. it's not like, you know, <laughs> it's not like going to Oklahoma, you yeah. know, it's, uh, we're taking some chances and, uh, you know, I'm like, fuck if, if, you know, there's one other, per- if there's, there's one guy and if he fucking bails on me before Monday, mm-hmm. Then I may change up our entire route. We fucking we we may do something totally different because I've never. I want to do something like if I'm not sharing this experience with other people that haven't been, yeah, you might as well make it a new experience. Then I'm gonna go find something else, you know, because I just like seeing what's around that bend, you know. Like this weekend, I was out at the Brazos. My buddy Randolph shows up. Man, Randolph's fucking traveled all over the world, and uh, now he's running his his uh, family's cabinet shop out in Weatherford. And we jump on some paddle boards and. I just make them like, hey, get down here. I got a paddleboard. Let's go. And like, we take off paddling. We get like, I don't know, half a mile down. I fucking, I like get off on the land. I start look, looking around. I'm just walking and walking. And I hear him go, hey, where where are you going? You know, and I'm like, and it, it never, I never even thought about where am I going. I'm like, fucking, I'm going to go as far as like, you know, I got to, I got shit I got to go back and do. But like right now I've got you with me. Like, let's go fucking exploring. Like I didn't even. Didn't even think about that, but that's kind of like how I travel. You know, yeah. I always just want to see what's over there. So to go back to the same places, no, with different routes. You know, like that goal is this place, but you know what I mean. Like your goal was BDR, but your EDR, route EDR, 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 EDR sorry EDR uh, EDR. So, but the route changes. The goal's not even EDR. Okay, no, the goal, the the trip is the. You know, the the EDR is like just something to shoot for to to like, you know, to end the trip at. But on now, like honestly, if this dude bails out, I don't know that I'm going to EDR. Yeah. Like I got a whole honestly, I'm thinking like, fuck it, we're gonna rent horses and canoes, put the canoes on the horses, ride down the fucking you know the canyon of the Rio Grande and get on our fucking canoes and go catfishing, you know, <laughs> and not even go to Baja. <laughs> Or I'm going to go to fucking Baja and hang out at the bottom where there's like a sick surf spot and there's whales coming in. How's the water down there? Is it cold as shit still? Like it is up in the California and whatnot? I don't know. I've never been there. We should go find out, Jace. <laughs> I don't know. I'm scared to take my bikes down Hey, there. speaking <laughs> of finding out stuff, I uh, what is what's your year look like? This year? Yeah. Not next year. <laughs> this, this year's year. already halfway through. Uh, camp out next it's week, a third of the way through. Uh, then I have a lowrider ST build for Born Free California. This shit's loud as fuck, right? Probably, I can't hear it. And then after Born Free California, I, I have a couple projects I got to get done for uh, this FXR tour stuff. And oh, then for October, yeah, for the Born Free Texas. So what are you doing? Well, tell me about your FXR for. Uh the FXR tour thing. Uh, I've always been a fan of Al Emerson and that he's been building this FXR for a year or so now. And so you're um, just going to take that one and ride it. I wish. Um, 
Honestly, yeah, there hasn't. Al been, is a badass. He's dude. a badass. He is. There, there hasn't really been an FXR that's like an idea for a build. Air quotes. That's been very exciting to me at all. You know what I mean? You didn't like the Pan American motor in the FXR. No, I'm not saying it isn't cool. It's just not. It don't like. I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. You know what I mean? For me. And so, like, when this idea came up across, when my buddy hit me up about doing this whole tour thing, it was just like, well, fuck, now I have a reason to build an FXR other than just, hey, I'm going to build an FXR. And B, I want it to be something kind of, you know, choppery. So this is the choppery, idea. Choppery, like fucking 90s. No, like FXR we're doing chopper. all D-Rake I'm style. <laughs> Emerson style. So you're going to do a D-Rake FXR. Yeah. Yeah, how much of a D-rake and how tall and how it's kind of going to be up in the air. Uh, Corey from Main Drive is helping me with this stuff. Oh, yeah, and, you got um, good people on your team. Yeah, and so... You just let him do whatever he says. Uh, yeah, but, you know, if I leave it up to him, it's going to be too it's, low. Yeah, it's not going to be... <laughs> It's not gonna so be the, the thing is, the thing is, that it's a it's two forces of a nature. It's an idea, and then you got him with his style. style so it's like a little bit of me kind of forcing him to go outside of his box mm-hmm. will allow him to do something that he normally doesn't do. But I'm still trusting him because of his knowledge uh, of building choppers and whatnot like that. So it's like I'm not saying that he can't. He's not gonna have executive decision on certain things, but I'm definitely gonna try to push him to do something out of his normal wheelhouse. You know what I'm saying? To, uh, you know, just whatever it ends up being. But his wheelhouse is really so big. It is. For it sure. really, like, he, his wheelhouse, he's capable of so fucking much. Exactly. His he's, style has changed so much over the years that, you know, I think just him knowing that he's building a bike for you and you like that style is probably enough to let him just run free. Yeah. I really want to, you know, this, this bike, I, I see it in my head and I see myself riding it. And so I'm really like I'm hoping to get it done. You're a fucking sure. photographer. You're yeah. already, you've already thought about the photos, where yeah, they're going to be taken, how you're going to look in the photos. I, I never really take <laughs> pictures of myself in the bikes, but you know. Uh, but you're thinking about that. I just no, even I if it's not even for a photo, but the way you're seen on the bike. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that, yeah. that when you build a bike, like you got to think about that because you know when people when you're riding. That's in a one group, thing you can think about. I I think about it because I I'm in my business is making bikes pretty. You know what I'm saying? So I want them to look badass when they're sitting in a parking lot, and I want them to look badass when they're going down the road. So yeah. to me, it's like I think about all that stuff, all these angles that, that things are viewed at, and I want it to have an aesthetic and a, and a vibe to it. So the way graphics come on bikes, the way colors are kind of laid out on bikes, it all to me it all like matters. And, and the way when you're building, air quotes, some type of chopper where you have a little bit more control over certain aesthetics of the bike – then, yeah, you know, I, I can't ride Bare Knuckle Paul's, you know, FXR chopper. It's way Where too Where are your tall. feet going to be? Mid-controls. So, I got to be in a position where I feel like I'm comfortable because I want to travel the same across the country. So, I don't want a bike where I'm fucking, you know, pro street choppered out. Or, you know, I'm not trying to have fucking rabbit ears sitting back with fucking forward control. I'm not doing that. I want it to be an aggressive riding <laughs> position, but... Um, you know, like blending a lot of shit that I like, and it might all be a fucking cesspool of dumbness when it's done. But I doubt it. I'm, you know, like that's I think that's what's cool about air quotes building a chopper is like what FXR Mike was doing back in the day. It's like it's it's supposed to not be what everybody else likes. It's supposed to be something. Well, not that it's supposed to be what everybody else doesn't like, but it's supposed to be what you like. Exactly, and. You know, and I, and I, I, don't think, I think the less you think about what everybody else thinks, yeah, yeah, the more happy you'll be at the end of the process. Yeah, and that's a that's a tra- that's a place that like a lot of people that are more or less on the customer side of building bikes, they get to enjoy that aspect. But when you're in the aspect of this is my livelihood, you have to think about what other people like. Because if you're out there building shit that people don't like, I don't know. I mean, you can. That's one approach. That's the approach you're taking. <laughs> Most people who build bikes in order to inspire people to want them to pay no, no, them. No, I to see build what you're saying. Bike. But I'm saying like you can also do it from a place of passion. Yeah, right? like that's this is this is what I want. Not that I don't care about what you think, but I want this for these reasons. Yeah. If you're smart, you'll be on board. If not, peace. Yeah, and th- there there's an element to that, right? Or, or there's a 
Because that's of, what Jobbers is. Yeah, that's, the, that's part of it. This is what I want. Fuck what y'all want. Well, exactly. I mean, maybe I'm, that's why you're doing the air quotes. That's what I'm saying. Like, there is an element of that where you do want to. I mean, it, it is the responsibility of builders and people to kind of push boundaries as well. But it's also like what makes good builds good builds is when you do push a boundary, but you keep it in. You you find a way to make it aesthetically pleasing to a lot of people and how it looks, regardless of whether they're into that or not, mm-hmm. right? And so how it looks going down the road, how it looks sitting in a parking lot. Yeah, but I think that's up to your eye, right? Like, so what I'm saying is, like, don't worry about what other people are going to think. If all those things line up for you, that's what's important. And that will translate to those people. Because if they see you enjoying it and really believing in it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It, it that shit runs downhill. Oh, I agree. I, I don't disagree to that at all. Yeah. But I, I just try to tell people it's like just having a little bit of, uh, you know. Consideration. Consideration for all the different variables that are going into different aspects of building bikes or customizing bikes that you, you, you know, you, you want to build something cool. But you also want to be authentic to yourself as well. And, you know, sometimes you build something like it was cool in my head. <laughs> Didn't come out that cool. But yeah. fuck it. I'm stuck with it for at least a little while. You know, you got to live with that, too. So, I mean, I've, I've had paint jobs I've done on, on my bikes. All right, hold on. We get, we blew past what I was trying to get at. Okay. Uh, so, October, Born Free Texas, October, mm-hmm. September, October, November. November, I'm going to Nepal. Fuck, this year is just going by quick. Yeah, and so I, I'm planning on doing uh, Indian Larry Block Party this year. So we have our big our big group that we do every year. We split it into two different trips this year. We're doing because we have the Midwest, and then we have like three states on the East Coast that we got to knock out to have all 48 as a group. Mm-hmm. So in July, we're doing Dallas straight north around the Great Lakes and then back, and that knocks out all of the Midwest. And then in September, we have – Florida. We've all been to Florida, but we haven't ridden to Florida together. So that's kind of like why we got to go knock Florida, South Carolina, and West Virginia off. And so in West Virginia, that puts us like right a couple, like uh, the week before Indian Larry. Just get a handful of pills and just ride through the night. You'll well, I, most time. of the guys are going to come home after that, but I'm going to break off and go to yeah. go to New York. And because, um, like I said, if I can just experience. I love that block party. I love being in New York on a bike. It's 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 amazing. Oh, to me. I'm definitely going to the block party this year. Yeah. So that's my thing, like that. And then I come home, and then we have, <coughs> I got to finish the FXR, mm-hmm. and then we have the Run to Terra Lingua, which is a fucking great event. So I'm gonna leave and go to that event on the. When FXR, is that? The weekend before Born Free. Wow. So go to that, and then we our tour starts in Durango and it ends in Born Free. So. You're going to go to Trilingo, go to Durango. And then do the tour here, and then bam. And then after that, uh, the only thing I got after that is uh, we do the Down South Camp Out, which is in Florida, and then we do a little Key West rip after that, and then back home, and then my year is kind of done after that. But No, no. We're going to do a trip. Where? We're going to go to Oklahoma. <laughs> He's like, what the fuck? Okay. Yeah, we're going to Oklahoma. You're going to ride that bike that I was that I rode in on today. Okay. I'm going to ride my other Pan America. Mm-hmm. We're going to go to eastern Oklahoma, ride around Talamina. Mm-hmm. We're going to camp in the fucking dirt, and we're going to ride some off-road trails. I'll do, do that. Do part of the tat I'll over there that. in Arkansas, and uh, it's going to be sick. I would do that for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good. Yeah, the the timing's going to be the toughest fucking part. I That'd think, like, early. So December's fucked because I got... Christmas parties, but I think if can you just take off during the week? I mean, yeah, people yeah. don't need shit painted during the week. Honestly, we man, can go ride motorcycles during the week. Yeah, I, I, I can build a fire, camp in the woods, eat mm-hmm. some mushrooms, look at God right in the eyes. <laughs> right here, I'm the captain. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, no, yeah, I'd be down. No, I want to take you on a ride on the Pan America, mm-hmm. uh, just to go ride around in some dirt, just show you like. Just show you a piece of that. And in eastern Oklahoma is a place I haven't explored in years. Mm. They got a ton of fucking trails. It's real fucking rocky, uh, but it'll be fun. In Arkansas, right there on that border, it's fucking beautiful. You've been up there. That's yeah. where you're going. Yeah. It's fucking great. So we'll go do that. We'll even go by Adam's place. We'll go stay at Adam's place, camp out one night, and then go hit the trails. No, I'd be rad. 
I definitely like to do that. I've been wanting, I've been thinking about getting a Pan America, but it's kind of like down the line for me, honestly. I, I just don't know. I don't know yet. I don't know. Like the trip you did to South America is my is one of my biggest on the bucket list, right? Do you is your bucket list like go to Alaska and then go down there, or no, just go down? I there? just want to. I, I really like I said. I really only care about South America. Central America doesn't really do much for me as far mm-hmm. as like, and I don't have like some like I got to do the whole road start to finish. Doesn't really get do anything for me. I do want to do Alaska at some point, but that'd be something different. Um, but I, I don't know. Like I just want to experience that, and then I, I want to start experiencing more Europe. Like I haven't, I've never been there. I've never been out of the country to be honest with you, but like I just want to, man. Like I, I uh, what's his name? Uh, Tim Gigastat. He uh, invited me to the Nepal thing this year, or I think you're doing somewhere different. India, India this year. India. With, he's going to be, but it's in September. In India with motorcycle Sherpa, and then I'll be in Nepal in November. So I want to do these things, and I'm I'm trying to, I'm trying to set my life up to be able to juggle all these different things that I want to do. And honestly, if air quotes, if the video shit with YouTube turns into some kind of paycheck that's like that could help me do more shit to make more content, then fuck, dude. If if YouTube would end up paying for me to be able to go to Nepal trip, hell yeah. You know what I mean? Do podcasts and that that some of that pays some bills at home. And then YouTube will pay for the trip, and then you know things kind of work out that way. It's it's the same thing that you're doing. You know what I'm saying? Like you're, I wanted to talk to you about that. It's like, do, would you say that like your podcast and the MC Shop Tees kind of thing has opened up the door for you to be able to do all these different type of things? I'm just not very responsible, Jace. <laughs> Neither am I. I have a twenty dollar shirt on, a twenty dollar pair of pants on, and thirty five dollar eBay boots. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, dude, I just fucking. I just go. Yeah. I think the hardest part is just starting. And I'm just dumb enough to not think about what's beyond the next move that mm-hmm. it makes it easier to take the first move. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, yeah. But no, it has. No, the podcast and the MC Shop Tees, you know, the way that thing started was the, the podcast, you know, there were people listening, right? And then David Brown hit me up one day and was like, hey, I want to sponsor the podcast. And I'm like, well, that won't do you any fucking good. You know, like <laughs> there's people listening all over the world, you know. And I was like, but I really do appreciate that. And he was like, well, I just want to support what you're doing. And I'm like, let me think about it. And I came up with the idea, thanks to my sister-in-law, with the t-shirt company, you know. Yeah. How about I just feature these different shops and send these shops t-shirts out to different subscribers and, you know. And build that subscription base and share the love throughout everywhere. And so what turned into David trying to give me money, I made a bunch of T-shirts, thanks to Lee Bullock and Oliver Peck, sent those out to my subscribers, and then gave David a box of T-shirts that was worth well more than the money he was trying to give me. And he was like, what the fuck? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I know. It's cool, right? Like, I don't know how this happened, but, you know. I just spread the word about brown cycles and I got paid and you got t-shirts and there's a bunch of people with cool shirts that nobody else can have, you know, like, Mm -hmm. so yeah, that has grown into something that's, I mean, I fucking, if you're a subscriber to MC shop tees and you're like, dude, I haven't gotten a t-shirt or he won't answer my emails. It's me. Like I have fucked up some things, but it's, that's like, that's where it's at now where it's like, Fuck, I'm just, like, trying to keep that thing. Uh, I'm just trying to keep people from being upset because, you know, it's, like, it's, it's awesome. Work. It's awesome. Like, there's a lot of T-shirts going out. And I'm featured, I mean, featured shops like David Brown's Brown Cycles to Indian Larry next month to a surf shop in Costa Rica to George's in Montrose. You know, just every type of shop that has helped me out or helped people out I know along the way or is capable of, Helping out all the other shops, you know, like yeah. Indy and Larry. I, met, I got to hang out with Bobby this year, and that was super rad. I never got to meet Larry. Uh, but, you know, it's like, do, you know, it's just cool to be able to feature all these fucking shops, do something that's limited. Yeah. And, yes, that has made this possible. Literally, that is what is paying for everything. Uh, like I said, my buddy Randall has really kicked on on this last trip and made that possible. Uh 
But MC Shop Tees, all those subscribers, and I got a bunch of sweet things planned that, gee, yeah. Yeah. Well, it, so finding ways to monetize these different things that you're doing, and, you know, because we're doing a lot of the same, not same, but similar things, right? And, you know, obviously the podcast. Not painting anything. Yeah, well, I'm not fucking riding in South America, so um, it, there's, it's still, it's still, it, it's a weird place, right? Like you're making podcasts, you're doing, you're trying to find all these other ways that you can kind of monetize it without like fucking up the integrity of why you started doing a podcast. You know what I mean? Because if, if you start chasing sponsors everywhere and it's just about money, then the quality goes down. It's, it's, you're not doing it for the love of it anymore. It's just like, it's a check, right? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's like, you know, I, I did a, like, I've got 14 podcasts sitting on, on a hard drive right now from driving to Washington and bouncing around shops all the way down the coast that, like, that was possible because of our Patreon and our sponsorships through things. So I was like, all right, I could put a couple months together, pay for hotels, gas, uh, the time off from painting to go do all this stuff. And now I got content for two or three months, right? And then I can come home and knock out some paint jobs and I have a little bit of free time so I can practice this YouTube shit. And so it's, you know what I mean? So it's like all this money is going back into making stuff and bringing on more people in these. Uh, it's never going to stop. It doesn't. Right. And so now it's like, fuck, I did a, West, a Northwest trip. Like I really want to do an East trip now. Like go sit down with a lot of people out there with all my equipment in it, you know, in my Jeep and just like really you know, get to know some, some of these more, these individuals, like some of the shops and some of the individuals doing rad shit out that way, you know? And then it's like, okay, well now if this YouTube kicks off, I really want to start documenting more of those travels and I want to do it on bikes, obviously. So like the Nepal trip would be badass. Um, and it's like, they just, it, it kind of like opened up a whole new like pathway in my mind of like, fuck man, like this would be like, if I could go to Nepal and do podcasts and make YouTube videos, like, damn. It's all work, but it's, like, the work that I love to do. You know what I mean? And so, like, that's what I'm getting at with you. It's, like, all this stuff kind of opens up new pathways of, of trying to monetize things so that you can continue to stay on the road, do these things that you're doing to help bring this content to everyone. You know what I mean? I'm just trying not to let it collapse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> same, same. I don't know. Trying, I don't know that I'm trying to monetize it, but I'm like, uh, I'm just trying to like keep it going, you know. Uh, yeah, mo money's part of the the equation, but you know, like I want to start doing the. Not that I really want to, but I I know that it would be beneficial and people would enjoy it if I started doing more camera work for the podcast. But I don't want them to be advertising Viagra before. I'm not going to monetize my videos on YouTube. Nothing against, you know, that approach. And I may change over time. But right now I'm like, fuck that. You know, like they're not going to sell Gatorade or whatever the fuck they do at the beginning of podcast. I would rather like, you know, have my boys make a 15 second, 30 second commercial, you yeah. know. And I'll play that, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, but it's. Yeah, I don't. I, th I think we have two different approaches. Yeah, be, well, <laughs> <laughs> we're, you, I think we're, it's the same approach, but we're just doing it from different angles, maybe. But you know, at the same time, not to get in your business this way, but you got a different home life than I have. Right? Oh yeah, absolutely. So that that dictates a lot more. And then, like in the last year and a half, the cost of living in Dallas has fucking doubled, dude. My shop used to be a thousand dollars a month. I'm all, I'm almost paying. $2,200 a month for this in two years difference in price, right? After I built this shit. You know what I'm saying? And it's nice. It's really and nice. And so it's like it, it, the the rate of everything going up and cost of everything from my the, the mortgage at my house to, to this shop to the paint materials to everything involved in this, even the programs that I use have double, or almost doubled in price. I'm still using free ones. And so I used garage band on some. You might be able to tell when you listen to the podcast, but, but it's just hard because, like, it's you know, yeah, I want to support all the all the small homies, but when you get to a certain point, there's there you know, there's a certain amount of bills that have to be paid to keep this thing running. Oh yeah, right. And what I'm trying not to do is get to that point where it's not like cool people like Bare Knuckle Paul or or you know, you know, 
Thunder Max or something like that, it's like I got to get Harbor Freight to come in here and pay this, you know, $4,000 a month bill. You know what I mean? Like I want it to stay where it's the people that are actually in our industry can be supportive of this and that money actually helps, you know. But you start running, you start getting the production too big. You know, if I actually had to pay him a salary of, you know, $6,000 a year to, or, or a month dude, to be Jamie's here. Jamie's worth that. Look how hard he's working over there. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the goal. I want to be at that point. But yeah. at the same time, it's like, fuck, you, you know, like that's entire, that's everything I make. I have to double it now. Right. Yeah. Off of this podcast and, and the other things that they're doing. So it's so like, you see, that's where I say I'm irresponsible. Yeah. Uh, if, if I was even getting close to that, then I would have gone to, Antarctica while I was at the bottom of South America. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have blown all that money in like fucking three days. Yeah, it's it just just it, to get my bike on the fucking the southern continent for like yeah. thirty minutes. <laughs> it just it, it does it seems like a lot, but it it it's gone like that after you pay the bills. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, like I said, this this shop is and trust me, like I I, I kinda don't want to be in here anymore, but I, I can't go closer to Dallas. It's more money. Yeah. So and I'm already 30 miles south of Dallas, and we're at the line where after this, it's just the country. And getting yeah. somebody to come from Dallas way out here to do a, a live podcast is harder and harder. It's tough. I mean, you're in Weatherford. You're like 60 miles I away I did from my here. first podcast at my shop today in like, I guess I did one last week, but we weren't in my shop. We were yeah. like on the back property. But today in my shop, I did the first podcast in months. And you know where that guy was from? Mm. You think it's hard to get somebody from the United States in your shop? Try Slovakia, okay? Yeah. This guy rode his motorcycle from Slovakia to uh -huh. my shop. It was it was a terrible podcast, dude. For real? No, it wasn't terrible. <laughs> but the dude was like, he's like an IT dude. And, you know, he didn't really, like, push the boundaries of his experience in South America. Yeah. You know, like... I wouldn't say he took the safe route, but he didn't like, he didn't go hit the trampoline of death. Yeah, yeah. He kind of stayed on. He the, didn't on the ride eight B. Yeah, you know, he was on a fucking CRF three hundred. It's like he could only go like forty five miles an hour mm. in the headwind. <laughs> but he's a nice dude, and he's storing his bike at my place for like, I don't know. There's like no limit on how long you can leave a motorcycle in America. So his bike might be there for months. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, he said 10 months. He told me, he was like, hey, can I store my bike at your place for a couple months? I'm like, sure. And then he was like, oh, man, I didn't expect you to say that. I really mean 10 months. <laughs> like, <laughs> and then he was like, hey, man, when I got here, they didn't tell me there was any limit on how long I could store my bike in America. And I'm like, what the fuck are you telling me that now you're just going to like leave it here, leave it here for how long, dude? Yeah. But he told me I could ride it today. And I was like, well, I would, but it's a fucking piece of shit. Honda <laughs> 300 CC. Dude, I'm not riding this motherfucker down my driveway. Yeah. So yeah, I can only imagine how hard it is to get people to come here 30 miles from the airport. <laughs> It's not so much that. I'm just fucking with you. You know, you're, you're like. No, you, it is tough. You travel a lot more than I do, and you get a lot more of those podcasts that are like from these people that you meet. Yeah, well, we've used our budget differently. Instead yeah. of me building something like this, I just keep putting in my gas tank. Yeah. You know, uh, you know the quality is definitely not what you're, you're producing here, you know, uh, at, by any stretch. But I, I uh, you know, sometimes I feel, I wouldn't say I feel bad, but I, you know, I know that. I could do more for the people, not even do more for them, just showcase them in a better light. You know, mm -hmm. like sometimes when I hear my audio, I'm like, God damn, that's not great at all. But I'm like, wait, I just pulled that out of my saddlebag. You know, like yeah. in the situation, the experience that I get to experience with people, it's, you know, th I think that's one of the things that may hold me back is I value, I put more energy towards the experience yeah, than like, I gathered that else. from yours, and that's one thing that made me want to go on the road with this earlier. Like I, when I took the cameras and went out there, is because when you're in here, you're kind of in my world, yeah. right? It's my life on the walls and shit like that. But when I'm at your shop, I'm in your world. You feel more comfortable about opening up and talking about it, or like some of the ones that you've done, like especially while you were going through South America. 
you're in the moment, right? Like to capture some things in the moment is so much nicer. Like when me and my boys did this trip, we stopped in Silt, Colorado once on the side of the Colorado River and camped there and did a podcast. And to this That's day, a cool spot, isn't it? it's one of my favorite podcasts we did because you can hear the highway, you can hear the river, you can hear everybody sitting there just kind of like enjoying this time. And that, we've gotten to the point where now like that takes place. We do a pre-trip podcast in here, but that in the raw in the moment was something that was very like I felt like we captured it much more in a raw aspect. Yeah, um, and it's tough to do as you found out. I'm sure it's hard to. It's when you, you when show you up, show. you're like, hey, I got three microphones. Yeah, and you just threw a fucking party with 15 people. Yeah, you know, <laughs> like we've got to get rid of 12 of them. I keep telling people that it's. You might not agree, but I find it very hard to really nail people down at events to do podcasts. Yeah, no, with them. it's fucking terrible. And I almost feel like even when I do nail them down, I don't get the podcast. It's or like the, interviewing Troy Aikman in the playoffs, the Super Bowl run in the '90s, and wanting to talk about his whole career. Yeah, you're not going to do it. Like fucking, yeah. he's in the Super Bowl mode, playoff mode. Yeah, go to like Born Free and talk to an invited builder. Who's been working hard to get this one build done, and now it's done. You're not gonna be able to like dig very deep. Yeah, you know, it's just like a not a great opportunity. It's not a great. It's just the timing's not right. I, and I feel like, in a sense, there's also like this aspect where maybe those events need to be experienced yourself. Yeah, and relationships need to be made, and then those kind of podcasts or whatever kind of thing you're gonna do, you know, content wise. Is something you can plan for afterwards, right? So that's what I've been doing from the get go. Yeah, I find it to be. I mean, I tried to go to Daytona once and and do podcasts. It was a shit show. I tried to do it in Sturgis once. It was a shit show. It's just it doesn't lend itself to get great content unless you go like I love going to Sturgis and sitting down with Patrick from JP Cycles. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think last year we didn't do it, but like the past three year, two years, we've done a pod. Well, maybe it's been three years. We can go to Sturgis as homies and sit down, like, at the campground. I'm talking or, about Patrick lives in Sturgis. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you do it every year, like, you know, like you say, you like to go to these places every year. You know, go to that, you know, that that makes it a little easier than, like, meeting somebody. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. It's tough. <laughs> Especially when you put cameras in their face and fucking giant lights, dude. Like, I don't really put those. Fuck? Those those aren't those don't go on the road. The camera stuff on the road. It, it, this was an experiment, and I I don't know how much I'm going to do it. It's just kind of uh, it's it's a pain in the ass to yeah. do all this stuff. I mean, I, I literally I got I, I sat down with Rusty Butcher. We did a podcast. I set up all the cameras. We do the podcast, and it's like fuck. All right, dude, I got to get to Phoenix tonight because I got to do another one of these. Oh, my God. So I got done with this podcast like 11, maybe 12. At out there. night? No, at 12. No, in the daytime. Because I, I, I got a hotel right over there in Marietta or wherever the hell it is. Got to his house early. We did the podcast, all the video stuff, recorded it all, packed everything up. It takes like an hour to set it up and like 30 minutes to take it back down, right? Mm -hmm. Jump in the car, haul ass to fucking Phoenix, go sit down with Cruzy, go into his shop. Put everything up, go live, and then it's fucking St. Patrick's Day, and there's a club next door, just doom, doom, doom. And still a great podcast, but it's like that day in general was I left that podcast, drank quite a bit with them, sobered up, drove to Benson, Arizona from Phoenix, and just slept in a fucking Love's parking lot that night, and then drove the rest way home the next day. It's like, so exhausting to do this and try to capture and that was it. At the end of the trip the end of the trip <laughs> no, you know it's just no. so much like it's and it's like i don't you don't want to put that like i don't like using social media to put all that shit out there and be like oh woe is me because i still i still had fun like yeah it sucks i'm sleeping in the parking lot but it's like fuck i didn't want to drive till 2 a.m and then get a hotel for three hours it's like i'll sleep in this fucking loves parking lot saw a badass sunrise those are always cool you don't get to see those much whenever you're a guy like me. So, <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know, man. Like, I, it's fun, but it's it's just a lot of work, man. It really is. It's tough. Then, it's terrible. I don't know. It's terrible. I, I'm complaining about something that's awesome. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> it sounds so terrible. Oh, man. How's Rusty Butcher? How was that podcast? It was good. 
Yeah. It was good. Yeah. Was that going to get out in like three months? No, nah, man. I think all the podcasts I did, they'll finally, they'll trickle out up until Born Free. And that was my goal is to give me enough content. June. to get Yeah, June, to get me June. the end of June. Um, and I'll still do like this podcast will come in the mix. And, you know, I, I, I do five a month for sure. Five a month. Sometimes if, if I have time, I can knock out six or seven in a month. But, mm -hmm. you know, with a camp out with all these little small builds going on right now and these paint jobs like this is it just gives me so much more time to focus on on getting those projects done. But the problem, dude, when you don't podcast a lot, I feel like it's like I felt I felt rusty on this podcast, to be honest with you, like on my end. Like you're you're great, but I feel like man, like things aren't firing quick enough to get the questions I want out, or maybe it's because I was drinking non-alcoholic beer and I didn't get enough fucking juice in me to kind of get me rolling. Damn, you so. drink a lot considering that's that non-alcoholic Guinness. Why would you do that to yourself? It's delicious, dude. Whoa, it's fucking good. Okay, I'm trying to fucking chill out on drinking a little bit. Yeah, good job. <laughs> so good I get non out. I don't know. It's just the thing, but but no. <laughs> What's wrong with Topo Chico? No, I drink that too. I always got Topo Chico down there. Yeah, because I usually drink it with whiskey though. That's the problem. Oh, you fuck your whiskey up by putting Topo in there? Hey, I fuck my steak up too by cooking it a little bit longer than everybody else yeah. does. <laughs> fuck, dude. No wonder you're bitching about doing podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> you're not enjoying the finer things in life, man. Oh man. <laughs> no, you know the video thing. I'm gonna approach it with a different. You know, obviously, it's going to be different. Yeah. But I am going to take it on the road and do it way different. Uh, Mama Try was a test run. Those videos came out really good. You know. But, I mean, you you were kind of using the Flat Out Friday stuff, right, on that one? That Yeah, that was that was theirs. Mm -hmm. All that's theirs. Uh, you know, I took over their podcast. Dude, and it was a lot. I did, like, fucking six in that one day. Have you Damn. heard? Have you seen the one I did with Haley? No, I just seen the one like this the parts of the bare knuckle Paul one. Oh, that I, dude, wait till you see the fucking Haley one is so good. That fucking girl had me roll. Dude, she was making me nervous and like fucking uncomfortable. She was just motherfucking me. Now she was like telling a story and just motherfucking, but she was motherfucking me. And I'm like, dude, this bitch is like fixing to hit me with something, you know? Like, <laughs> dude, she was cracking me up. It was really good. It was my favorite one of the whole day. For real. And then we like, so uh, this guy uh, from Bell Helmets was there. He gave out all the guests Bell Helmets that day. And at the last minute, they were like, hey, he wants to come on your podcast. And I'm like, ah, not fucking happening, you know? Like, And then all of a sudden, uh, but it's not my call. It was just like me being arrogant, you know, like, yeah. fuck that, you know. But he, he was awesome. But my fucking smart ass idea while I had Haley on, she's like fucking talking about dildos and just motherfucking everything. I'm like, I'm bringing him in now. You know, I'm like, tell JC to come in, you know, and I, I tell her what's going on. She's like, okay. Dude, and then she went fucking straight pro on me. Dude, it was like working with a fucking anchor at ESPN or some shit, dude. <laughs> she cleaned up everything, started talking about how much she loves bagger racing and shit. I'm like, what the fuck just happened to this crazy <laughs> Canadian, dude? It was so awesome. Like, she just kept... I wouldn't say she was surprising. She was impressing me the whole, the whole fucking time. Mm. It was awesome. Uh, you know, I finally got to have, like, little Chris on there. I hadn't had little Chris on the podcast. Uh, Brad Richards was a good one. I want to talk uh, to that dude. Yeah, yeah, Brad's great, dude. I don't think uh, they're going to talk to me anytime soon, though. <laughs> no? What'd you do this time? That was just when we leaked those photos. Which photos? The the CVOs. The new ones that I just seen today? No, the, those got leaked by someone else. These are the ones that came out in March. Last month. Yeah. There was new, you leaked more photos? Is this like a reoccurring thing? People sent them to me and said, hey, put this out there. Yeah. Like lots of people. It's like a lot of people have these I photos. I bet it's Brad. I bet Brad's like, hey, fucking. Hey, get this to Jay. Send him to that fucking they, uh, Fast Life guy. They uh, Send him the Fast Life guy. Harley, He's got no filter. Har like, I had it. I put it in a reel and put it out there. But then Harley, like Harley Corporate or whatever, did a uh, thing, like a copyright infringement thing on my on my uh, Instagram. Yeah. Where it made it take it down. Really? To where I would have to go. They flagged you. You got flagged by the motherland. Yeah, mother company. As I was going to buy a brand new bike from them, <laughs> dude, I bought a brand new bike from them and went to Sturgis, and they tried to tow it. For real? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I 
uh, it's that fucking Pan America. I go, to, I rode the BDR to Sturgis. It was sick. It was so fucking awesome. And I get there and I go see Kerpius at the booth, you know. Mm-hmm. And I just park my bike like by the stunt guys, like around the corner, not even where there's any traffic, right? And uh, I go inside. I'm talking to him. He introduces me to some one of the engineers on the project, and I'm like telling him about my trip there. And, and then I go to leave, or I'm meeting Kerpius somewhere. And Kerpius comes around the corner, and he's just like tail between the legs, just like like pouting as he walks up to me. He's like, "Man, I hate to tell you this, but they just got on the intercom and they want to tow your motorcycle right now." And I'm like, "My bike out there?" He was like, yeah, they say it's not parked in the right spot, and they want to tow your motorcycle. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah, they should be asking you to put it, you know, right in front of everybody, you know? And I'm like, yeah, I know. I parked on the side where it's, like, out of the way. And I was like, tell you what, how about we just hang out here and you just take a picture of them towing my brand-new motorcycle that I just bought from them. But he wouldn't do it. (laughs) So I moved it. Oh, comply. (laughs) You know, it's a fucking giant corporation Yeah, uh, trying to not get canceled, you know? As though that's possible, because I don't think they could be at this point. You know, if there's a company that could stand up and be like, you know, fuck chicks with dicks, it's Harley, right? They're just not doing that. Yeah, they're definitely not going to do that. <laughs> no, it's, it's I don't know, man. It's it's one of those situations. It, it's, just like I said, the shit came into my, my, my possession. And they said, hey, put this out if you want. I'm like, all right, fuck it. Yeah, why why couldn't you? Yeah, I mean, it's like. I don't know, man. Whatever. Right the- now, the information on the internet, like that's one thing people are struggling with right now. Is once it makes it to, because I'm even struggling with it. You know, I'm like, fuck. Somebody just used my photo for a flyer at an event I'm not going to be at. You know, like, that's kind of fucked up. But once it's out there, anybody can use it for yeah. whatever. I mean, I could have, I could have like fought back on the Instagram stuff, but I'm not. I love that company. It's fucking tattooed on my goddamn neck. It's like it's not about that. It's just, it's just, it's just content. You know yeah. what I mean? That's all it is. And it's like, for me, in the in the custom side of this industry, those things are helpful. You know how many brands probably were about to double down on making more parts for something else? We're like, hey, I might wait. Instead of spending fucking 100 grand on this new tooling for this idea I had, let me wait till this new bike comes out and I'll apply it to this bike. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, it's it's clearly just the same frame that, that it's been with some add-ons. Just like the Rushmore, uh, when they did all that in 14, 13 yeah, 14. You know what I'm saying? So it's, I don't know. It's dope. No. You don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But I get what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, you know, I can understand it, but yeah, I would have done the same thing if I were you. I fucking post that shit. Yeah. Well, I don't because know. Because it's out there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right? fuck. If it's getting sent around in text messages. Like I said, there was. Knocking a, on their door. It was a group message. Apparently, the someone sent it from the York factory to one guy. And that guy put it in a group message with like 10 people. And then out of that 10 people in that group message, three of those people sent them to me. So I got text messages within 10 minutes of each other from three different people who I come to find out were all in that group message. And so I just put it out. Like they all could have did it, but they didn't. I think they were too close to the source. Yeah. You know, so I just said, fuck it. I was actually in a, I had just did a podcast with uh, Max Chef. I just left the shop when I got the pictures. In uh, o- Oakland out there. So it was like, oh, fuck, yeah, don't mind if I do. Bam. And, uh, but, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't, I don't think Harley's ever going to fuck with me in certain aspects. But, you know, maybe we'll come around one day. I don't really know what I, what, what I like, you, you and the Pan America was a perfect fit, right? Because they don't make choppers anymore, and you're a chopper guy. But I, then you, you jump into that. that. But, like, I can't see you going down the highway on a CBO, dude. I would definitely go down the highway on a CBO. I'd love to watch that. I think that'd be kind of cool. But I wouldn't do it like, uh, yeah, I mean, I I, ride, I like all motorcycles, you know, like, uh, yeah, I mean, I you, you call me a chopper guy. I don't see myself as a chopper guy. Yes, I do love my chopper, mm-hmm. and I would never, do you want to know something fucked up about my chopper right now? Because mm-hmm. I went to register it. Uh, last week because uh, the five-year antique plate went out. And the only reason I was going to do that is because I'm going to Mexico and I need to, like, get a yeah. temporary tag. And I find out that somebody in Pennsylvania registered my same title. Now I have to, like, get a 68A in criminal inspection of my VIN number on my cases to make sure that it's legit. And then they got to argue that with the people in Pennsylvania. 
which is crazy. But yeah, I don't. I mean, I love all motorcycles. Mm -hmm. You know, I started out on a twin cam. Harley. Mm -hmm. Actually, I started out on a fucking, you know, a, a Suzuki Savage. You know. Like, I can I see just, you riding something called Savage. I fucking love them all, <laughs> dude. I got a KTM. I got a Honda. I got a Yamaha. Yeah. I have everything. Uh, but, yeah, people, you know, the thing about the chopper, what, what took off with that is everybody who rides any motorcycle. Like, look at the parking lots of bike shows. If you go to an adventure rally, mm -hmm. you know, like the – the one in Tennessee, the fucking something planes, what is it, Teleco planes rally, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. There's only going to be adventure bikes in that parking lot, you know? Mm -hmm. If you go to a hog members show, there's only going to be like new motorcycles in that parking lot, maybe mildly customized. Yeah. If you go to, uh, is there like a bagger show? Yeah, like it's Sturgis. If you go to a bagger show at Sturgis, there's going to be baggers in that parking lot at that show. Mm -hmm. But if you go to a chopper show, if you go to like Giddy Up, right? If you went to Giddy Up, if you go to Born Free or Mama Tried, there is every type of motorcycle in that parking yeah. lot from hog members to, you know, antique members to adventure bikes to baggers to everything. Everybody's got to love and respect for hand-built choppers mm -hmm. you know like it's just what other bike you know curates that kind of following I agree yeah there there i mean there isn't you know you're gonna find race bikes in that parking lot you're gonna find everything you know if you go to the races you're not gonna find it i mean the races are the only other thing where you might find every other type of motorcycle but <clears throat> race bikes is kind of where choppers yeah you know originated from was people customizing bikes to race with so I think that's maybe why <clears throat> people see me as the chopper guy because it's taken off in so many directions. But, mm -hmm. dude, I love everything, you know. Uh, I could, you know, there is, I had an FXR for a while. Yeah, I remember that. The only reason well, I got rid of it is because I had to get rid of something, you know. <laughs> like, I had to sell something, and I was like, an FXR is a lot easier to get than a, yeah. than a panhead. Uh, and I would have another FXR. I would, need, I would like to have a new soft tail. You know, just like having this new Pan America right here, dude. That I just, you know, I could have rode my chopper over here. Not give them actually. I, I could have, but it's on the lift right now, getting ready to leave for Mexico on Monday. But I've been riding that motherfucker around town like it's my work truck. You mm -hmm. know, strapping everything on it. It'd be cooler if I was on a soft tail. You know, just riding that thing around as my work truck. Yeah. You know, I could see having bags on my Pan America is you know. That's fucking handy. You know, I could have a bike with fucking bags. Did you have bags when you went down to South America on it all? Oh, yeah. Okay. You had those roll top, waterproof, fucking mm. soft bags, um, which are great. And if you're, like, thinking about getting an adventure bike, a Pan America or a GS or a fucking Africa Twin, get the soft bags. Because you're going to fall down, and those fucking hard bags are going to get bent, and they're not going to seal up right. They're not going to be waterproof anymore. And then all your camera gear is going to get fucked up, you know? Yeah. Trace got his his Pan America on the raffle still, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think I might buy a couple of tickets tonight, see if I can. Uh, Who's this? One of our homies uh, in Dallas. He helps us put on the bike night that we do, the T-Bar Tuesdays. Okay. They were having some stupid deal on Pan Americas uh, about six months ago, three months ago, or whatever, and uh, he bought one good deal, and... Just doesn't ride it, you know. He's a bagger guy, more or less. But he's had a little raffle going on for it, and it's like, fuck, man. Like, yeah, he's, as of last time I looked, sometime today or late yesterday, he was down around 70 spots left. Yeah. I think it's $100 a spot. And How many spots was he selling? 200, I think. Whoa. It's brand new. It's got like less than, it's an it's a S or a special, whatever, however they do that on those. And, yeah. uh, and he did a special. A day or two ago, for like, the next four hours, if you buy a spot, it'll be seventy five bucks instead of a hundred or something like that. Yeah. A little, put a little enticement on it. Um, but yeah, it'll be sold sooner than later. Yeah, I just suck at gambling. <laughs> I feel like no matter what, if I ever if I ever want a sports team to win, automatically they lose. If I ever if I love what this guy, what sports do you watch? I used to watch uh, a lot of sports back when I was younger, but I felt like. 
when I would watch it or I'd, when I would want somebody to win, it, it would always almost like will it into existence not to win. You know, Do you I watch used, any racing now? No, no, no. I, I used to watch a lot of UFC shit back in the day. But like when I got into UFC, it's like all the really famous fighters were kind of on their way out. So like I oh I love BJ Penn he's my favorite and every time I'd watch him he'd get his ass kicked I'm like yeah well the this the, sucks. the originators were like <laughs> they weren't the best it was like the skateboarders when skateboarding took off it's like yeah. they weren't real athletes they were just yeah. like the crazy ones doing this extreme sport and exactly. now it's filled with athletes mm-hmm. so so you're not watching the bagger racing at all uh, I I mean I what I w- have watched it when it would come out but it's kind of all funky like the way they do all the all the showing of it right like. The BRL is um, a bagger racing league. They've been, like, doing videos, but then releasing it a month or two later. You already know who won everything, so it's kind of like yeah, you lose – you don't really have it there. And then Moto America is, like, I guess the premier league of this bagger racing stuff. But I don't know. Like, I feel like I'm watching a sport bike show filled with Harleys, and it just – I don't know. They're, it just doesn't – do anything for me what you should do is you should like do your own live broadcasting Uh, uh, you should you should commentate i just i'm not that interested in it man yeah like i I think it's cool as shit and i i love that it's happening but it's just not like i didn't get into harley's because i wanted to race them you know so i mean it's it's like this man there's a lot of things in the in a motorcycle there's a lot of different avenues people can find Mm -hmm. to have fun in it there's just certain things that i don't give a shit about what you should do is you should use all this shit you have here, though. Maybe find some people that do give a fuck. Yeah, I mean, yeah, for sure. But And then, like, do a fucking multicast where people can watch that and then listen to you guys talk shit about what those announcers yeah, like are saying. Like a fight companion kind of thing? Yeah. Man, I well, thought because about- it's like... Like Supercross is, I really enjoy watching Supercross. But just like anything, like when we grew up watching football, my dad would always have the radio on. Mm -hmm. I couldn't ever understand why until like, you know, past few years where if you're listening to a game on the radio, you care about the sport. Like you're just in a position where you can't watch it at that point, right? Yeah, Yeah. So the people on the radio, the announcers on the radio, they're talking to fans of the sport, Mm -hmm. right? They're like... They're communicating what's going on from a fan aspect. Yeah. When you're watching it on TV, those announcers are like talking to the fans that are on the fence. Because the people that are watching it as fans, it doesn't matter what the announcers say. They're watching the race. Yeah. Like they're going to watch the race no matter how retarded the No matter how many times the announcer says, hey, whoever gets the whole shot is going to be out front. You know, like they're not going to quit watching it because of that. But the people that are on the fence are like, that's who those announcers are talking to on TV. They're not talking to the real fans of the sport. Yeah. So I think there's always like a, like even with Supercross, like right now somebody could do this with Super, and maybe somebody's already doing it, where it's like an actual fan is watching this shit and doing his own commentating. So the cat, or the, this is, this is what I see with that. I've watched just about all of the BRLs and the Moto Americas, right? So what ends up happening is that, like, the Moto America is kind of like there's a lot of different races that take place, and they're not, like, right there, right? Like, UFC happens, and you got prelims, and you got fucking, like, the undercard, and then you got the fights, right? Yeah. Bam, let's do a podcast. Next three hours, we're watching so-and-so fights. There's shit to talk about. The bagger racing, like, when these, these baggers go out, it's, like, a few minutes, and then it's over. And then... There's this one thing, but it's like three hours prior to it. So it's like hard to stay connected to that one thing yeah. long enough, right? Yeah. And so I'm not saying that I don't give a shit about it because I definitely do. There's it's just a lot not of, an, it's not presented in an entertaining not, way. It's not presented in any entertaining way. And the, I don't think that it was ever just like the Moto America stuff. Like they that stuff was all designed just to have like racing events and leagues, right? But trying to put that on like mainstream TV, like I watch MotoGP a lot. Because it's fucking entertaining. And it's like, it's captured in a way that's like, you can sit down like, you know what, I'm going to go check out MotoGP today. Have a beer, you know, See, that's whatever. that's funny you say that because the other day I was thinking about while I was watching, like recently on Peacock, they've gotten really good at like making you watch commercials when you're watching Supercross. It's fucking annoying as shit. Now, anybody listening that doesn't like that, if you start the program, like after it's already been started, you can fast forward through the commercials and get to the you know, 
the heat races without having to watch commercials. As soon as it's over and you try and fast forward, they make you watch the commercials. If you're watching it live, you have to watch the commercials. But if you do it while it's airing, you can start at the beginning and fast forward. But anyways, I started wondering, like, you know, I, I follow a lot of, like, vintage racing uh, Instagram pages, and it's fucking awesome. But I wonder how long it took the, you know, the Supercross Racing League to get to the format where they're at now. Yeah. Where it's like, you know, they do all the shit during the day to figure out who makes it to the heat races. You know, now they do the 250 heat race, a 250 heat race, a 450 heat race, a 450 heat race, and then two LCQs and then two mains. Mm-hmm. But how long did it take them to get to that format where they like figured out how to narrow it down and then have, you know, a certain amount of races there at the end to build up excitement and then figure out who wins? Yeah. So I guess <clears throat> the Bagger Racing League is, I guess, in that developing stage where they're trying to figure out now that they got the, the money's there, the people want to race, the infrastructure's there. Now they got to figure out a way to like make it presentable. Yeah. Until they do make it presentable and they, because, the money is only going to be there for a little while until in, until it can produce like revenue backwards. Real money. Yeah. So basically, you have like like right now. I, I like right now it's being sustained because people are just people hungry. Are trying to win. They're hungry. They like people want this to exist. But what? All right. So if you have like all all this, everything's advertising. That's everything. That's money, right? So. The reason why certain things have money in it, like football and all this shit, is because of advertising, right? So these platforms, whether it's the BRL or Motor America, has got to make a palatable experience for people to watch it. Because then if you have 100,000 people buy the pay-per-view, then now there's money for those people that are going to sponsor those riders and sponsor these events to put money in it because they get 100,000 people watching it Mm -hmm. because it's presented, right? And that's maybe low numbers, but that's what it's about. If you have all these races that take place and nobody knows about it, nobody sees it, there's no, like, broadcast of it, the uh, the actual uh, promoters is what they are. Like, BRL is a promoter of this. Moto America is a promoter of, of, uh, of the King of the Baggers. If they don't do a good job showing the world that stuff, then all those sponsors are going to go look for another place to put their money. Mm-hmm. So there's just a lot of things that, I, like, I feel like they're not – Taking into consideration yeah. at this point. And it's like if you want it to grow, then you have to grow. It has to be, like, viewed, right? And, I mean, I... I, I mean, I think that's where a lot of racing promoters fail. Yeah. Is, like, showcasing uh, what's making the racing possible, whether it's the racers or the brands behind the racers. Yeah. You know, Roland Sands does a really good job of it with his, you know, when he was doing the... Fuck, I guess he's still doing it... Uh, but the super hooligan shit. Yeah. He did a really good job of, you know, mainly showcasing his racers and the race and the event, but giving people like me the chance to do the same thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. I definitely didn't, uh, you know, what do you take it complete advantage of that opportunity? I mean, I, I got all of it that I wanted, uh, mm-hmm. but there was a lot, I left a lot out on the table. You know, mm-hmm. I could have filmed a lot more, did a lot more self promotion in those events, but he does a really good job of making that possible. And so does Jeremy at Flat Out Friday. Yeah. You know, the way he's got that that Friday night fucking set of races. You know, we went we're there it. all fucking badass. We're there all day long getting ready for the night show. And he makes it real clear to the racers, hey guys, we're putting on a show. Yeah, I know you're here to race, but what we're really doing is putting on a show for the people in the exactly. crowd. Exactly. And he he does a really good job of communicating that. And that's where a lot of like race promoters aren't able to see the whole picture. Yeah, yeah. And it well, sounds like that's kind of where... Moto America is the premier situation here, but the average guy can't afford to get in there. It's like $3,000 or something like to enter, to be in a race. Yeah. So you're run-of-the-mill guys that are building these baggers in their garage. They're not going to be able to get the sponsorships they need to be able to afford to get in, plus the three sets of $800 tires they're going to take. They're going to need in this well, they deal. they probably don't deserve it, especially if they can't even showcase them on the other end. Well, that's what Showcase I'm saying. the so, people that do have the money in a way that makes it worth them spending. Right that now, money. I mean, the only thing, honestly, in my opinion, this could be this probably has a little bit of ignorance to it, but the only thing that's keeping that thing alive right now is the Indian uh, Harley feud or that racing thing because they're both making their own content and showing the world. Yeah, right. 
Well, not everybody, you know, and I'm not saying I, I think that everybody that's, that wants to be in any kind of game that's, that has to do with promotion, they need to be self-promoting in some kind of way. If you're going to be racing, then you need to be fucking promoting yourself in some form or fashion. Right. I mean, that's one way to do it. Yeah, because that's, you know, uh, like I said, it's just not big enough for the people to I mean, come see, at you. My experience racing was literally for the experience. I, I haven't gone to, a, like, my goals at the races I've been to aren't like, I'm going to do this for a long time. Yeah, yeah, You yeah. know, it's like, I'm going to go out there and race to just, exp just to go see what it's like, you know, more or less so that I have context and experience to talk about later on. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I have a different approach. But, yeah, you know, they could do a better job giving those people the platform or helping them have a platform to showcase themselves and their brands. Yeah. But, you know, there's a guy I need to have on. I'm sure if he's listening to this, he's cringing because he wants to talk right now. Uh, this guy, he put out a film. I can't even think of his fucking name. He put out a film called Fast and Left. Have you seen this? It's a mm -hmm. documentary about flat track. Uh, ended up following Jeffrey Carver along, you know, filming Jeffrey Carver win the last AFT race on the Harley Davidson XR 1000. Mm -hmm. It's a great film. Um, but yeah, I mean the, the racing, you know, at that level or the, I mean, the only reason baggers are being raced is because there's big companies behind it that are yeah. putting money into it. You know, like the average Joe can't afford to go race on a fucking track. That's is, you know, yeah, they cost that much money. They don't even get used that much. So, like, to just to have that real estate. Yeah, cost, yeah, it's like the fact that they even let me race my fucking twenty five hundred dollars Sportster at the Mint four hundred in the <laughs> desert. You know, like, I can't believe it. There's fucking million dollar trophy trucks out there. Uh, so I felt very privileged to be able to scrape by and get into that. The podcast I did with Rusty Butcher, he actually went quite a bit in depth with like the whole flat track movement that kind of resurged about what seven, eight years ago now yeah, and how it kind of went and then kind of died. I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't exist anymore, but it's definitely not as hot as it was like three or four years ago. You know no. what I'm saying? And he talks a lot about that. So, you know, when people, when that comes out, people get to hear a lot of that, but they're just racing in general, man, like it's a, it, it's fun. And anytime, like, I remember the first BRL, the first King of the Baggers at Laguna Seca. I think we were all here at the shop watching it. Stoked as hell. I, I have a few friends that were actually racing on that deal. So it was just, it was awesome to see. And then it kind of blew up and it kind of immediately turned into two different companies. So there's already kind of a little bit of a drama going on. And it just, you know, like, it just hasn't transpired into anything yet. And there's lots of companies still investing a lot of money in it, but it's tough, man. It's tough to know if that, like, if it's like, if you're a company and you want to like invest in something within this motorcycle community, do you, do you want to put thousands of dollars into that yet? I mean, I would hope so, but with the promise of it, like lasting and going on and, you know, like it's, it's just a tough one, man. Like, I don't know. I feel bad for a lot of the people that really have invested a lot of their money in their bikes to get them dialed in. Well, I think that the whole landscape of that has changed over the past 10 years anyways. You know, mm -hmm. like before you had to get you had to get on a podium to like have exposure in a magazine to promote yeah. a brand where now you can like, you know, you can ride your motorcycle naked and get a bunch of views on the Internet. You know, like there's a lot of other ways yeah. to get eyes on the product. You don't have to just get on a, a podium to make it in a magazine. Yeah. So it is interesting, like how much money. I mean, I can't imagine how much money Harley and them are spending on keeping that thing going. I mean, rivalry's good, man. Like it's it's definitely fueling a lot. You know, yeah, but think about the money they're spending on that, and like, you know, what about if they were just like able to invest money in the production of Sea Bears videos? You know, like what? he does a better job of like showcasing a bagger yeah. than any fucking moto racing league is ever gonna do. Yeah, right. Agreed. I mean, like hands down, if they were to give him that money, God knows what he would do next. He'd like probably wheelie on a fucking you know, uh, aircraft carrier or something, you know, like who knows? <laughs> that sounds what pretty cool. I know it'd be <laughs> sick. And that's the kind of money they're spending, you know, on 
a bunch of people to get a little bit of money. Yeah, but the money they're spending in that racing is also, we already see it trickling down into the bikes. It's already bringing forth motorcycles that I think are more along the lines of what we want. And I think for the first time in maybe forever, Harley is finally ahead of the curve, right? Like the meaning, first time ever? That's a bold statement. As far Since as... you've been alive, maybe? Hmm. Maybe since I've been out, but like usually Harley's like producing a bike that that people have to then take and make it what people want instead of it's re- ready to go out of the box for for certain aspects. Like when I when I speak, I'm speaking on like the the custom side of things. Like the, the that's whole, just the cus- consumer base is always going to want to change it out of the box. Yeah. Even the fucking the ST, you know, there are some people riding around on that stock ST, but yeah. Yeah, well, okay. they're gonna change that stock ST to make it more their. their well, and that's shit. what you want that to be in a bike. You don't want a completely done bike, but you want you want a good starting foundation. And I think that the STs and the new baggers that are gonna come out are gonna give us a much better platform to start on. But we're always gonna like Harley is about it, like making it your own yeah. in some form or fashion. That's why it blows my mind that you can buy a brand new M8 Softail for less than fifteen grand. Good luck. Like a base model yeah the fucking yeah Yeah. that's a great starting point it is a good starting point but yeah you're talking like soft tail standard yeah yeah dude yeah move up a little bit just go with a low rider yeah i mean like it's like like, think about the price of a brand new harley right now Mm -hmm. right and the the price of a brand new harley 20 years ago hasn't changed that much has it it's definitely more a little bit more yeah now think about a brand new truck right now and the price of a brand new truck 20 years ago. Yeah. Definitely it's like fucking more. 200% more. Yeah. Fucking brand new bikes have not gone up that much. Not not comparatively to the car market. But to, to anything, I, really. So my statement about, like, they're finally ahead of the curve is, to be fair, let's just say my lifetime or my, my involvement being in the motorcycle industry. In 2004, five or six, like right around there, they dropped the rocker seat. I mean, they were ahead of the curve in 82 when they put out that FXR. I was yes. way ahead of the curve. Yes. <laughs> um, but then you get like, then, you know, they, they, they start making the stretch bags, right? And they put them on all the bikes. And we all didn't want those anymore, right? So it was like, next thing you know, everybody. Stretch bags? They put stretch yeah, bags? Yeah, the little stretched longer bags. They used to come on the CBO models. They just, they always had a hard time, like, putting the bike out at the right time, right? When the market was right for it, right? The Lowrider S in general for the Dyna was kind of like a good time market. It was like the Dynas were hot. This bike comes out. It's giving people a big motor, blacked out bike, good platform to start on, right? Same thing when they actually brought the Lowrider S back in the Softail version. And then even the the, the Electric Glide Standard was like a very stripped down bagger. They, you still got an M8, but you didn't have a radio. You didn't have certain things that a lot of us in the performance bagger world didn't really care for, Right. And now with the new bikes, it's like it's got the inverted suspension. It's got, like, you know, nicer, newer angled rear bags. Like, it's supposed to have a, a, a more horsepower-producing motor, um, a new infotainment. Like, there's a lot of new shit on it that I think is, like, right when we want it. You know what I mean? I don't know. That's just my opinion. I just I mean, the fucking Pan America is right when I wanted it, I guess, yeah, too. Yeah. So, it's like, you, like, I feel like right now in the last, like, four years, they've been able to produce bikes that are actually – hot on the market right now that people actually really really want instead of like being a couple years behind the the when do you think that started i think it started right around the lowrider s the dyna so like 16 15 i think 16 and 17 was only years of the lowrider s right around there so i think there they started getting on the on the right path and and a lot of it what it was explained to me was a lot of it was quick to market stuff meaning that all they did was take their existing models and either take certain things off of it or black out certain things or put a bigger motor in it and call it, you know, Bob's your uncle. Right. As opposed to a completely new platform bike, which is, you know what I mean? Like we didn't, the Lowrider S was a perfect thing. It was, it was a murdered out big motor bike with, with, you know, I guess their version of gold wheels. Let's just call it, you know, baby shit, Brown wheels that, they put out and people fucking like they got a lot of the stuff they want out of the rip. You know what I mean? And there was the, still the chrome version. You can get the big blue pearl, uh, chromed out Dyna if you wanted to go a different route. But man, everybody wanted that lowrider S. And the same thing happened with the 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 soft tails. 
You know what I'm saying? Like when they dropped the low rider S and the soft tails. I remember we were on a trip in fucking Tennessee. We were at Moonshine Harley when they first one dropped, and we were out checking out the dealers. Like this is fucking rad. And two of our buddies ended up buying them. You know what I mean? So it's like, I don't know. I think, like I said, 16 to now, I think they've been pretty good at being on on par with being able to produce motorcycles that people aren't going to, you know, like, oh, this is stupid. I'm going to take, like, like the only bad bike they really made but, but still had good shit to it was the, the Sport Glide. Badass bike, badass bags. But then they put this dumbass bearing on it, and they put only forward controls on it. So you're in the worst riding position. You know what I mean? But it still had the bags, and the bags were amazing. So it's like everybody took the bags and stuck them on the regular low riders, and then Harley's like, oh, I guess we could do that. Uh, obviously, they had the ST in the works already, but you know what I mean? There's just certain shit like that. I fucking haven't looked at a new motorcycle or paid attention to any of that shit. You're just like speaking a different language to me. Yeah, right you look now. like I mean, you're looking at me like you don't. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is this guy talking about? That's why I said you're a chopper, dude. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess so. Yeah, I guess I guess I am just a chopper guy, you know, riding a There's fucking wrong with that. The 2022 Pan America downstairs right now. <laughs> you're just a biker, dude. That's all there is to it. I like that. I'll yeah. take that. I, I'll take that. Yeah, it's crazy how the bike. There's bikers everywhere. Yeah, but they're all different in different places. Yeah, you know? I, there's not there's not one there's not one narrative that makes that I, I think makes a biker a biker. Really, honestly, I feel like I it's. Do. I don't. I, I mean, as long as they're riding a bike, I think that's the prerequisite that's important. But um, not everybody that rides a bike is a biker. No way. I'm not. You're 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 responding to me in absolutes. You know the you know what I'm talking about. Like I'm not saying that like if everybody has to be the same person and ride the bike to be a biker, then that's fucking bullshit. That's not the way it is. But yeah, are we you talking saying like, that every biker rides a bike? No. <laughs> I'm saying that there's not one narrative that this is the only prerequisite. Or the only set of like things that you have to check off the box to be considered a biker. Oh, there is though. Yeah, you got to yeah. be a, a fucking a Let bike ri- a bike rider and a wrench. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I wouldn't agree to that. I think that there are plenty of people that lay down thousands of miles that don't know how to use tools, and I think that's fine. I know. I know. I'm not saying it's not fine. I'm just saying they're not a real biker. Okay. There's a bike rider. <laughs> yeah, I guess. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. I fucking I really envy somebody that can take off across country with like a fuck like Brian Helm, dude. He's like I'm like, you got any tools? He's like, Yeah, I got a broken pair of scissors and a fucking <laughs> you know, a fucked up screwdriver. I'm yeah. like, dude, you're insane. Coast to coast. That's kind at of least biker. once this year. I think mean, have yeah, the balls is a, that sounds pretty ballsy biker to me. I mean, maybe you're right. I mean I would is Brian Helm a biker? Yeah, maybe he is. Now you might, have, you might have just changed my mind, Jace. I'm just I'm all inclusive around here, dude. <laughs> That's gay as fuck. <laughs> Don't let Harley hear you say that. <laughs> Come pick their bike back up. <laughs> oh man! I'm gonna bleep that one out and put a timestamp in that. No, <laughs> that no. Uh, no, I mean, I, I think that, dude, you ever just, for the fun of it, just go onto a Facebook forum, any motorcycle forum, and just the way, like, people just splurting out their opinions about everything all the time, right? And I've never done it until the Pan America. For real? And holy fuck. I just can't even, it makes me ashamed to even own one. When I look at the shit that comes out of the people's mouths, yeah, that are on the Pan America Facebook page, <laughs> it's probably people on there that don't even own one. They just want to go in there and talk shit about it. That, that may be true. Yeah, yeah, that's insane. It it it's I don't know, man. I I think that like when you that that feeling that you get riding motorcycles or being stoked about a trip the, the next day, regardless of what you do in your life. That feeling of like, oh fuck, this weekend or this Monday or this today, I'm meeting up with the guys and we're fucking riding somewhere, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe hopefully it's out of out of your city, but you're doing something like that feeling. 
that's a biker feeling. That's something that you get out. Like I don't think it's it when you when you start saying you got to do all these things to be air quotes a biker or you got to do all these things to be a builder. There's so many different variations of how things are customized, how people enjoy motorcycles that it's kind of I don't think that that other people are allowed to call someone that. They can only call themselves what they think they they are. You know what I mean? Well, that's bullshit. I can call you whatever I want to call you. Yeah, that I doesn't mean, mean it's right or wrong, you know, or that I'm doesn't mean you have to that. agree with it. Again. I'm saying that when I think of a biker, I think of somebody who rides a bike and maintains that bike. Yeah, I think no, for sure. I, I think that that's an aspect that that. I think that if you ride a bike across country, but hold on, that in feeling general, you're talking about, like hooking up with the boys and leaving town, that's not only available with motorcycles. Oh, for sure. You know, like I used to do that with skateboarding. You know, riding bikes, riding dirt bikes, uh, bikes, obviously. But that's just like, you know, the feeling of camaraderie, hooking up and like leaving the everyday grind. You know, mm -hmm. the grind that you do so you can leave. Yeah. You know, and that's available through a lot of different outlets. Oh, I don't disagree in that 100%. But that doesn't make them there's bikers. Not a fucking cooler one than jumping on motorcycles and going to do. We're going to be meeting up to go play uh, Polo. Magic the Gathering or something. Uh, it's a Dungeons hotel convention room, but it just hits different when you're about to go way across the country. Different. Or, so, yeah. Well, it hits us way different. It yeah. hits those queers about the same, probably. <laughs> Digging that hole, baby. <laughs> uh, no, I... Whatever, man. <laughs> I don't know. I, I I, just... Yeah, there. I mean, you get these same feelings when you do a lot of different things. Like, I, 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 I see those patterns. I see those um, those connections in other, other aspects of life. Because I, I, I see there's certain things in the world of photography that I get out of motorcycling that I want to happen like i'd love to do a, a road trip or something with just a bunch of photographers just doing shit like that like nothing to do with bikes just in a car you know what i mean just like you would say doing a skateboard trip with people you know mm -hmm. but for the sake of a motorcycle podcast i'd say like that's a pretty unique feeling to just motorcycles as well too i mean you can't speak on like me and Jaden are doing our fishing trip this weekend and we're just like where are you guys going fishing i'm just saying oh you guys not, aren't going fishing no fuck no so that's uh, a great other comparison, dude. Like getting your shit together, fucking putting all your fucking camping supplies and fishing supplies on the canoe and taking off on the river. Oh, dude. Once again, not the same thing because I know that some other areas have the same thing. But like when you jump and you go out on a motorcycle trip across the country, there's always this like feeling of, will my bike make it? Am I gonna, you know, am I gonna make it? Like there's there's a little bit more of a a what if aspect to it that I think that makes it a little throw bit throw those feelings out the window, dude. Yeah, but I'm saying like they give you a bit of a confidence, dude. I leave on my chopper and I know it's going to make it. Yeah. Well, somehow you fucking do every time. It's weird because there's no other option. And like, yeah, even if it doesn't make it to whatever my destination was, I'm making it somewhere. Yeah. You know, it's like the, when I first took some guys on that trip to Mexico, the Desperado run, and I was like, all right, guys, you know, I got an idea where I'd like to go. And I got some, you know, some routes. But here's the deal. What we're going to pay attention to most is doing this together. Once we cross this border, we're staying together and we're doing whatever happens together. Mm -hmm. You know, where we make it, I don't fucking know. You know, we're going to make it to EDR, I don't fucking know. But that's not what's important. It's like experiencing the time on the road together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what if, if we're all working on somebody's bike on the side of the road, then that's what we're doing, but we're doing it together. Helping the yuppie. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just fucking with you. Dude, it, it I'm just saying. What are you saying? I again? have no fucking idea where we're even at anymore. We, on our big trip, we've kind of had the opposite where everybody's responsible for their own bike and we're on a time crunch and at some point, if your bike fails, you know, obviously and everybody you're fucking stop. left behind. Well, everybody will stop and help, but at some point. No, we try to fix things, yeah, but if yeah. it's not fixable on the side yeah. of the road, then it's their responsibility to figure out how their next move. It's not ours, yeah. you know, and the, the reason being, I mean, it might sound fucked up, but for the most part, most problems that we've had on the road have been fixable. You know, we had one guy that we literally worked on his bike almost every other day in the entire trip, but he still had to get a tow truck in one spot. We had one dude just completely fucking buy a new bike on the road, right? So it's like 
when your fucking rear pulley shears all the bolts off of your fucking wheel, we can't fix that on the side of the road. So he has to have a something, some contingency plan to get his bike to a place to get it worked on or fixed. And we all have to look at it like, is this something we can wait out with him? Or do we need to go ahead and hit this reservation, like make it to our reservation we had made the night before? Reservation. Yes. Yeah. Because unfortunately, like when you go to certain, I mean, you got. Yeah, maybe not necessarily a reservation, but we've got somebody showing us hospitality, putting us up. They've bought food and they've made the beds and everything else. Or, you know, it's a campground that maybe we reserved, not necessarily a a reservation. But yeah, and sometimes Sometimes it it is a reservation. No, dude, like if you want to go stay at some of these like cool campgrounds in America, you ain't getting in just on the whim. Not with nine fucking dudes. You might be able to fucking squeeze in as one person and go do that, but they're not going to let you in. Like, st- camping in Big Sur, we had to fucking book that out like six months in advance. You know, going to the 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 view at Monument Valley to, to camp right there under the monuments, like, you can't just show up on that shit. You know what I mean? And it's all Navajo land. You can't just really pull out there. They'll fucking, they'll find your ass with the... Yeah, you can, dude. That's what, that was one of my favorite spots was pulling out there. It was over by Mexican Hat. Yeah. Fuck, that camping spot we found was so sick. Well, like I said, you get away with shit. <laughs> Nine dudes sitting around a campfire. No, it is. It's, it definitely adds in a different element when you're fucking rolling deep. Yeah. So, uh, it's, you know, there's certain things you, you know, we, we, we have days where we don't know where we're going to make it. So we leave it open. And, you know, those days aren't necessarily, uh, put like this. We have half of our trip is planned and the other half is not. But mm-hmm. we know that we do want to experience staying on the coast of this place so we we're going to book a campground but we have we can make this we can make the two days prior to that a one long day one short day or two half days you know what i'm saying yeah so like i said when you travel with a big group you you got to fucking kind of make some plans and some of that stuff unless you're all just pulling over on the side of the road and just camping wherever but as long as you do it together it's gonna be awesome yeah i mean don't get me wrong I mean, that's the approach I take. I mean, I'm yeah. not saying it's the only way, but that's... There, I mean, there's there's something to that that I would love to just do that. You know, and I think also, like, like that trip specifically, we were going into Mexico, you know? It's a whole different... Being, it's like... Being in a different country. So yeah, it's like, together, you know, I'm not just going to leave my boy behind because his pulleys got fucking ripped out. You're yeah. like, no, 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 we're going to figure this out. We're not leaving him here. We're going to, like... <laughs> when we're going to figure Mexico. out how to get him home, you know, like... What fucking Willie and Jer, dude? Willie, like, oh, no, Jer's bike blew up, so they Jer like pulled the gas tank off and jumped on the back of Willie's bike, and they just left the bike in Mexico and and rode back, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, and that's the other thing is like when we like where we're going on this trip, there are places where if something happens, it's a game changer. Mm-hmm. It turns the trip into like a, you know. Are we leaving the bike? Or are we going to do what it's going to take to get this fucking bike out of this fucking canyon that's bigger than the Grand Canyon and back to the border? That's or why if I it, when I do go on a trip like that, I don't think I'm going to be doing it on a bike that I'm not going to do it on a twenty thousand dollar motorcycle. You know what I mean? I do it on a, something that if something happens and it's going to be more work to get it back out than it was worth, then fuck it. I'll leave a bike too and just fly yeah, home. But how can you make up a story like that? Well, I don't I mean, know. What's, I mean, what, what are you going to feel better on when you're down there on a, a bike that you don't really care about? Well, play like this. If nine of us are doing, we're doing the trip you did going to fucking the bottom of South America. Dude, right? if you can find nine guys and line up their lives yeah. where they can all go to the bottom of South America from Texas, I'd be impressed. Yeah. So let's just say in this Narnia place that I just described, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I find nine motherfuckers that can take off time work and can afford to do this, right? Yeah. But with that in mind, too, like the even if it was just this Mexico run you're talking about, like going deep into Mexico and looping back up, like, there, that's an experience that all of us are looking forward to having and whatnot. And I don't think that it, I think that if one of us, like the way that we are, we plan like that. We are, we already know what we're going to Okay. If the bike blows up, then I know how to, what we're going to do. Right. I might have to leave it here. I can find a way to get it back out, but 
I don't want to be the guy that ruined everybody else's trip because I was, you know, riding a piece of shit bike or maybe something just completely out of the normal happened. There's nothing I could do about it. Right. I get that, but that's my responsibility. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, if we're standing in the middle of nowhere, like my guys aren't going to roll off on me and on, on leaving on the side of the highway. That's not what we're saying. Like we make sure that everything's good and that's figured out and homeboys got to decide like, Hey, are, are you flying home? Are you buying a new bike? Cause we can't, what do, yeah, and to be fair, the the pulley bolts were in like Amarillo or something. It wasn't that far. That happened like, in New York. That was it. We were in out. We were in Syracuse, New York, when his pulley bolts came out. That was the second time. The second time it happened. Yeah, same dude. But that's when he bought a new bike. <laughs> second time. Same dude. Same wheel. Uh, oh, no, different, wheel. different bikes. No, different. same bike. New wheel. Oh, you're right. That's right. That's where he swapped to the Road King. You're right. Yeah. So there's there's aspects to it, man. You know, like. When I rode that FXR across country, I was working on it every other fucking day. And, you know, but I got it back on the road and fixed it every day and made it keep going or at least got me to where I was going. Same thing with our buddy with his bike that kept fucking up. We got it on the road every time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if it's like, like I said, it, it's just, if you say it like, oh, I'm just going to leave my buddy somewhere, it's like, no, we're not leaving anybody anywhere. But we're also not in fucking Mexico. You know, we're in Salt Lake City, dude. You can fucking get home from Salt Lake City. You can rent a goddamn U-Haul and take your shit back home. Rent a fucking wagon from a Mormon and <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. Get a horse to take you home. <laughs> so I'm saying, like, there's certain aspects to it that where, you know, if you say it a certain way, it just sounds fucked up. But if you realize that, like, no, we're in fucking, you know, we're in Oklahoma City, dude. He can yeah, get home. <laughs> it's not like a gas stop. And then we're moving on, or they're moving on, or whatever. It's yeah. so oh. much deliberation. There's Did I say that? You made it sound that way. <laughs> and then you said, well, well, we're in Mexico. And I'm like, dude, we're none of us have been in Mexico riding bikes. So yeah, the it's first like, time, the, the, I don't even think they were out of Texas, right? It was like Amarillo or something. Yeah, we made it to Amarillo, and his fucking pulley boats came out. And this is the beginning of his whole trip, man. He ended up, you know, you're, you're saving up money for, for six to eight months to go on this trip. And then, bam, first six hours on the road, your fucking pulley bolts come out and your fucking whole two week trip is done. Yeah, and he made he made the call to go yeah to, you know, take it home. Yeah, you well, know. I mean that was nice of him. I mean, he can't I mean it would be very selfish of him to just sit on the side of the road and make it our responsibility to fix this shit or figure out what he's gonna do yeah, with his bike. I mean, who would invite somebody like that around that would do anything else? He's just trolling us now. <laughs> I feel like you guys are trying to like prove something to me that I'm I didn't under I didn't ask for. <laughs> I'm not disagreeing with already. It seemed like you were disagreeing with me at first. <laughs> I just don't want you to think we leave our first five. Yeah, because you made it sound like well, Bob's dead. <laughs> Fuck him. And his 2012 uh, Dyna. <laughs> maybe I did. Oh no. man. Well, we can wrap this one up. Before. I believe you. I believe you guys wouldn't leave somebody behind. <laughs> we get them on an Unless airplane. their pulley bolts came out twice. I'd leave that motherfucker oh, behind man. for sure. He hasn't been invited on a trip since. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want any of that bad juju getting rubbed off on one of our bikes. Oh, man. How does that happen twice? Oh, dude, fuck. Karma. It's got to be. <laughs> it's got to be. <laughs> Somebody did a long time That's ago. Rude. That's rude. <laughs> It's got to be. Oh, dude, oh, I hope man. my bike makes it on this trip, you know. I mean, it's going to what, have to it, make it someplace. Before we wrap it up, let's say catastrophic failure of your bike in Mexico. What What do you do? Do you just. On my chopper? Yeah. Do I just, like, flag down a truck and start figuring out how to get back to Texas, you know? Mm -hmm. And I guess, like, depending on where I'm at, I would call up a friend in Texas. You know, like, hey, come on. Yeah. I'm going to start sense. coming this way. I'm going to start going your way. Now, the guys, uh, I don't know what they would do. I wouldn't ask them to, like, change their trip up. But if 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 that happened to one of my guys, like, say, say, uh, say, the, say Brian Helms with us. He's going to ride the Pan America. Mm -hmm. Say the Pan America takes his shit, you know? And I'm like, well, fuck, we're not leaving this bike here, you know? And I'm not letting Brian Helm ride on the back of my chopper, okay? We're going to find a tow. We're going to find somebody. We're probably, you know, we can't like, maybe we could call a tow truck. But we're probably just like going to flag somebody down, right? 
hey, we're going this way. How far can you take us? And then we would either just like parade behind them or uh, go to the next stop and just wait on them. You know, actually, we probably parade behind. I guess it depends on how sketchy the person in the truck was, you know, like. <laughs> yeah. If it seemed like a, you know, a really legitimate dude, we just like go to the next place and wait for him to show up and I don't know. I really don't know what the fuck we do. Yeah. Make sure that the bike, make sure that the person was taken care of and then go from there. Same thing we were saying. <laughs> I, 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 mean, on this I, I believe you. I believe you. Don't need to rub it in. Are you go to the camp out. No, he's leaving on Monday. No, I'm leaving Monday. Yeah. Jay schedules this like right when I leave town. A lot of people. We've had people that from the east that have come to the camp out and then go to do the EDR. That's a good timing for it. Yeah. yeah. So it, like they come through the weekend before. Usually ends up being something like that. So it's all good though. I got one question from the comments. Uh, someone wants to know how many miles you have on that Pan America. I don't know. Doesn't know, Jose. There you go. Uh, less than 30,000. I think the trip together from here to Ushuaia and Buenos Aires was 19. Okay. 19,000? I think there's like 27 on it. But don't hold me to that. If you want to know, go to Grand Teton Harley Davidson in, in uh, Idaho. Is that where the bike is? And look at it. Yep. What's it doing up there? It's on display. Oh, that's cool. Oh, yeah. That's rad. Well, Dan, thank you. You're an inspiring dude. Hey, Jay. Even though thank sometimes you. you. Sometimes I'm misunderstood. <laughs> you misunderstood me. Oh, that's fine. I don't leave my friends on the hey, side of the road. <laughs> <I> <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, bud. Bullshit. I know you'd leave them there. <laughs>